Rise and salute the flag. I put allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Have the reading of the Sunshine Law, please. Notice that this meeting was published in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act. Okay, as usual, uh, there will be no new business after 11 p.m. 10:30. I mean 10:30. Sorry about that. Um, but I, the reason I'm mentioning it is because it doesn't mean that the meeting just ends at 10.30. It means we don't take any additional new business after 10.30, okay? Um, may I have a roll call, please? Mayor Klaus? Here. Mr. McKay? Absent. <laughs> Mrs. Kelly? Absent. Mrs. Gilmore? Here. Mr. Tricocci? Here. Mrs. Tyndale? Here. Mrs. Baggio? Here. Ms. Costco? Here. Mr. Bradley? Here. Mr. Murphy? Here. Mr. Novarita? Here. Mr. McLaughlin? Absent. And Mr. Krollfeifer? Here. Do we have a quorum? Yes. Okay. The first order of business is uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hippowith. Could you please step forward to the podium and Mr. McKay will swear you in? Could you raise your right hand, please? And do you swear or affirm the testimony you give tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, something. Okay. I do. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Welcome aboard. Thank you. And how could we help you? Um, we needed to do some additional, um, make some additional adjustments to our house, and this is the reason we're here. So, I can just read from this and let you know what it is. Okay. Um, this is just some additional information so you can understand why we need this, these adjustments. The front door has no shelter at all, so when it rains, snows, or the wind, it's right on it. Could, excuse me, can you just get a little closer to the microphone oh, so everybody can hear you? Okay, that's better. This is just some additional information so you can understand why these adjustments are necessary. The front door has no shelter from the elements such as, but not limited to snow, wind, or rain. For, for example, when it rains or snows, it's directly on the front door. And when the door gets open, it gets inside the house. As a result of not having a portico, the entire door frame is, as it stands is now rotted. So to prevent this from occurring again, moving forward, we believe that for a more permanent solution, we should have a covering over the front door. Okay. Okay. As far as the covering for the rear deck, it has been challenging to enjoy that space. Again, this space has not been totally usable because it is extremely hot in the back of the house. There is no source of shade or shelter from the sun. We would also like to have it partially screened in. Okay. Now the, the the deck in the back is already there yes. and was approved previously, right? Yes. So you just want to cover, cover it? Cover it. A permanent screen. cover so um, we don't have to keep buying covers for the gazebo that we did have out there, but it was, okay. it's been several years and it's been rotted, so we took it down. Okay. Instead of spending good money after bad money, you know, we just want something permanent up there. Okay. Okay. And for the, oh, where was I? Okay. For these reasons, we're seeking your approval in order to move forward and with these projects. As homeowners, we want to enhance the beauty and function of our home. We hope this is enough to convince you to give us the green light to go ahead. We'd also like to improve, this will also improve the value and the function of the house, okay. of the home. Thank you. <coughs> Anything That's else? That's it? Yeah. Okay. Professionals, any comments or Mrs. Newcomb? Hello, uh, good evening folks. Uh, in your package you'll notice that I have given you uh, pictures of Six Patriot as long w uh, along with the uh, approvals from the board back in 2005 for their deck. Uh, and what they're really seeking here is uh, bulk variances on these. If you take a look at the denial, it specifically describes what they're looking for. 
uh, in regards to setbacks. Uh, they are very de minimis in nature, but nonetheless, is they, they are still required. Um, so if you take a look at what I've given you and you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, yet again, uh, this is not an extraordinary um, amount of uh, setbacks that we're looking at. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any, any comments, Mr. Miller? Oh, they want to put a little Taylor. Uh, we did not review this, one, Mr. Chairman. Any questions from the board? On the front porch, and they and they want to close the back porch. Are there any pictures or any ideas on what you'd like to put in this front? I didn't break. Yeah, I have ideas. It's just basically a six by eight, eight feet this way, six feet this way, and yes. Like the contractor himself had come to me in regards to this. It is uh, tied into the home. It's a, a solid um, But it will be architecturally similar to the house, the color. No, that's the front door. Yes. This, this front door as well is going to have similar to what the front of the house looks like in regards to that. It's basically going to be an A-frame. She's just short a few, literally a few feet of the front door setback in order to have this. If she didn't need that, I would be giving her construction from that. In the back, she's just going to be in a fixed roof to the side back of the house? Correct. Yes. It's across the whole deck. Uh, I have to say that I was out there last week, and it, it gets very warm back there the way the sun hits during the day. The only question that I have, and I've seen this in the past, obviously being in the, the business I'm in, is people will put it in a fixed roof on that back deck, and then they'll wind up closing it in, and it'll become a full-time well, we're not she had just you'll explained windows in, you'll buy them from no the i don't want that <laughs> we don't need she that had just explain that they're looking to screen it in. i just want to screen part uh, of it always starts as a screened in patio is what i'm saying you know where my eyes are at all the time everywhere so there's not much that gets by okay. we have enough living space inside we don't need that that as a living a part of the living space just to keep the sun away from us when we're out there I mean, even in the future, they could technically, if you were to approve this application, they could come in uh, and enclose it with glass if they wanted to, because it's already meeting the setbacks that you approved on the deck as well as the roof. And become low table space if they ran here. It could be a three season room easily. They would have to get construction permits, obviously. Any other questions from the board? If not, I'm going to open it to public comment. And it, public comment is the public can comment on this application and this application only. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to comment about the request for the front roof and back roof? Hearing none, I'll close public comment and ask the board, what's your pleasure? Need a motion and a second. I'd like to make a motion. I'll second that. Okay. Mrs. Gilmore and I'll second that. Ms. I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, any questions on the motion? If not, roll call, please. Mrs. Gilmore? Yes. Mayor Klaus? Yes. Mr. Tacochi? Yes. Mrs. Tyndale? Yes. Mrs. Baggio? Yes. Ms. Costco? Yes. Mr. Bradley? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. And Mr. Kroll Pfeiffer? Yes. Wait with the petite now? No? I don't want to wait that long. Wait with the petite? Okay. Um, yes. Can we ask for a waiver to proceed? Wait, that's what she's doing. Yes. Can we ask for a waiver to proceed? Yes, I was waiting for you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, we need a motion and a second. I'll motion that. Motion to waiver? A second. Any questions on the motion? Roll call, please. Mayor Klaus? Yes. Mrs. Baggio? Yes. Mrs. Gilmore? Yes. Mr. Jacochi? Yes. Mrs. Tyndale? Yes. Ms. Costco? Yes. Mr. Bradley? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. And Mr. Crowfighter? Yes. 
Thank you. Look, you do know that there's an ordinance that says you have to invite us to the first picture. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. Good luck. Good luck with it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of changing one slight thing, and I talked to the counselor. We're just this will take me two minutes. We're going to go to case C, which is uh, a variance request. But no one is here. They put in a letter requesting a continuance to the May 3rd meeting, and no no, no notice is required. So I need a motion and a second to take that action. So moved. Second. Okay. Any questions on the motion? <coughs> Hearing none. Roll call, please. Mrs. Gilmore. Yes. Mayor Klaus. Yes. Mr. Tricocci. Yes. Mrs. Tyndale. Yes. Mrs. Baggio. Yes. Ms. Costco. Yes. Mr. Bradley. Yes. Mr. Murphy. Yes. And Mr. Pearl Pfeiffer. Yes. Okay. Council, I lied. I said 15 minutes. It was only 10, so. <laughs> Let's wait five. <laughs> okay. Um, the next case is the Beacon of Hope. It's a continuation of the January and February meetings. And uh, the Councilor Eric Andrews is ready. Mr. Chairman. Okay, now we have a couple of people that have to be recused because I'll explain in a second, but Mrs. Gilmore and Mr. Klaus. Yes. You have to recuse yourself, Mr. Blair Adley. And anybody else? Oh, and then, sorry, Mrs. Baggio. And then um, Mr. Tricocci was not uh, here at the last uh, hearing. Okay. And he did not hear the tape, so he cannot hear it for this evening. Oh, he can't hear it at all? No, he doesn't have to read it. Right, no, he just can't. He can't hear it? He just, so he can hear it. He yeah, he can't vote. vote on right. it, sorry. Okay. Uh, you, could, you could hear it, and if you have questions, you can ask questions, but you can't vote. Let's see what we have. Okay. For the benefit of the folks in the audience, the reason for all this confusion. Um, Mrs. Baggio and Mr. Bradley both live within 200 yards of the applicants uh, where they're working on this project, so they can't hear it. And Mrs. Gilmore and Mr. Klaus, because they're on the township committee, cannot hear it either. either. So just wait till we shuffle some chairs around a little. Do we have seven? Yeah, do we have a quorum? You have six? It's not a, it's the issue is do we have uh, seven voters? No, no. No, we do not. Hey, and Mr. McKay is not coming? I don't I didn't get a phone call that uh, from Mr. McKay or Mrs. Kelly. We're starting at seven. Oh boy. Hey. Huh? Right. And Ms. Kelly. Yeah. We did change the time from six I, I to seven to six thirty for our meetings. So we only have So three, we're concerned four, there's meeting well, time five, confusion. Six, so, oh is that right? Six, well it could be. Well then may I suggest this? I mean we so we don't currently have seven voting members. Um, we would we, we need a few minutes to talk about that. Um, if you think there may be some confusion about the meeting start time, we would wait until seven to see if if additional members come. Is it? I got it right here. We're, oh, is it possible to give them a call? Okay. May we take um, oh, yes, please. a few minutes? Yeah, no, we're taking it, not you. Oh, okay. We're stuck. <laughs> Understood. But so they're, they're going to make a couple of phone calls, and we'll find out. Okay. But yes, please. Yeah, we're going to we're going to conference and uh, reconnect with you. In a okay. Few thank you. Okay. For the benefit of the folks in the back, we we're close to maybe not having this meeting right now, because we re we're required to have seven voting members available. And we now have eight. So, got it. We're good. Thank All you right. for your forbearance, and uh, <laughs> Council will let you proceed. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board and uh, board consultants. Um, as you may recall, my name is Erica Edwards. I'm the attorney uh, on behalf of uh, here tonight on behalf of Beacon of Hope. Um, we are happy to be back uh, to talk with you about um, a, um, an amended plan. Uh, we have made some changes to the plan, as you probably know, uh, because we have submitted um, the documentation, uh, the revised site plan and architectural plans, um, uh, at least 10 days in advance of tonight's hearing. So. 
um, that you can consider them. Um, what you're going to hear tonight uh, is um, from our um, expert witnesses. Uh, we're going to be putting our civil engineer, um, our architect, our traffic engineer, and our planner back on. Um, we'll be as efficient about that as possible. Uh, but we, uh, because we have amended our plan, we want them to, um, and of course your consultants have issued new review letters, so we need to be able to uh, address those. Uh, but um, generally speaking, uh, what you're going to hear tonight is a re-emphasis uh, on the uh, uses, um, the primary use, um, is a uh, house of worship. Um, that hasn't changed. We've said uh, from day one, so to speak, that that is, uh, that is who we are. We are a house of worship. That is our primary use. And the um, ancillary uses that we have talked about, uh, the, um, the food pantry and um, the uh, life skills classes and the other ancillary uses that we have discussed are just that. Their ancillary uses. Um, I, I'm sure you would agree that they're uses that many houses of worship um, undertake as a service to, uh, in service uh, to God um, and to uh, the community uh, at large. And uh, we are no different in that respect. Um, again, a house of worship, um, that is a concept that is um, straightforward. Um, um, in um, uh, many respects. And so uh, we haven't spent a lot of time uh, delving into uh, the details of that because it is um, uh, fairly self-explanatory. Um, it's these ancillary uses uh, that are not as self-explanatory. And uh, so those have uh, consumed a lot of time uh, on testimony, um, uh, in particular in um, response to questions from your consultants. But uh, you will hear tonight, emphasized by every um, consultant working for uh, Beacon of Hope, um, here on behalf of Beacon of Hope, that we are a house of worship. Mike Green. You will also hear that we have added parking. Um, we're pleased to have um, taken to heart the board's comments. Um, and we have um, added additional parking to our plan. Um, we've moved our uh, trash container to the back of the property in response to the board's request. Um, so um, without uh, further um, elaboration by me, I'd like to call our civil engineer, uh, Mark Malinowski from Stoughton Caldwell to um, provide detail on the amend, uh, amended um, aspects of our site plan. Mr. Malinowski, you're still under oath from previous meetings. Yes, thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Mark Malinowski with Stoughton Caldwell Engineers. Um, I'd like to uh, sort of recap what we provided for you at the last hearing back in February, um, where we presented um, the uh, site design, um, and, and I'll go through the what, what we proposed last meeting and, and what we're proposing this evening. So first of all, um, just to recap the building itself, you have the uh, split level that's to the west of the property that's joined by the one-story building uh, in the front uh, that was the place of worship and the fellowship center. And then we have the two-story portion of the building in the rear that was to house the uh, code blue and also the food pantry operation. So um, previously also we had uh, provided um, 29 parking spaces 
with two additional stack parking spaces in the rear for the employees. Uh, that brought like to a total of 31 um, spaces. Again, we still had the shed in the back and um, we had the uh, dumpster enclosure in the front, front yard of the property at the end of the uh, parking lot in the, in the front area there. So as a result of last meeting, <clears throat> there were concerns um, again with the dumpster enclosure in the front and trying to take advantage of the rear, uh, rear of the property uh, to add additional parking spaces. So what we did is um, we took the dumpster from the front area and put it in the rear of the site. We replaced that front dumpster area with two additional parking spaces and um, then we extended the parking lot in the, behind the two, in the rear of the property behind the two-story building uh, and we came up with a total of 36 parking spaces. So we had um, seven additional delineated parking spaces and, uh, in, and five uh, <coughs> parking spaces from our testimony uh, back in February. That was the gist, that's the gist of the parking lot configuration. Another big change that we made to the site is now we have, we're proposing to demolish the split level portion of the uh, facility. And that portion of the facility had a, uh, a, a commercial kitchen involved with it. So since we're losing that when taking down the split level um, portion of the building, we're adding a 280 square foot um, infill building um, between the one story and the two story um, section to replace that kitchen that's lost. That's also a one story um, addition to the back of the one story building. We've relocated the um, proposed uh, shed, which was in, at the rear of the pro uh, behind the two story building, and now it's just to the west of the two story building. So, in summary, there are the basic changes that were made um, to the site again to maximize the parking on the site and um, to address some of the other aesthetic concerns uh, that the board had expressed at the last hearing. Now one of the restrictions of course we've also been um, delineating the wetlands along the stream corridor that runs along the westerly property line. We have that delineated with a buffer and then there's also a finger of wetlands that projects into the rear of the property. We're in the process of obtaining permits number one for a letter of interpretation from NJDP and number two the expansion of this parking lot in the rear is going to require a statewide general permit from DEP to fill that area because right now it's a swale that drains into the stream corridor um, up along the uh, western westerly property line. So we're in the process of going through that um, permitting uh, application. So that's a summary of um, what we have proposed. There are some pretty major changes. Uh, if the board would like, I, could, I think the easiest thing might be to uh, go through the um, professional's letters and address their comments and it will re re-familiarize everybody with the, um, the various variances we're asking for and design waivers we're asking for. So if the board would like, I, I could do that. I think that might be the easiest and most ex expeditious way of uh, covering all the uh, testimony. Council, you have any other witnesses that are going to address this? Because I'd like to hold the eventual comments to after all your witnesses have presented. Uh, well, each of our expert witnesses is going to address certain aspects of um, your consultant's letters because obviously they lead. The consultant's letters, um, Mr. Taylor in particular, cover a, you know, a, a okay. I th of The only reason I'm asking is that I want to eliminate duplication of every, you know, we, we don't have to hear things two and three times. We're not going to do, we're not, okay. we, we've talked about this in advance, we're not going to do what they All right, yeah. so what you, you, you would like to go now to the, the, the comments from Mr. Taylor and Mr. M Miller. Mr. Malinowski would like to address um, Mr. Miller's letter and uh, sorry to point, apologize. Um, and also uh, certain comments from Mr. Taylor's letter. Correct. Um, our architects will address certain other comments from Mr. Taylor's letter. Uh, our traffic engineer certain other comments and our planner uh, others um, in turn. So uh, each of our consultants is going to take 
certain portions. portions. Okay, that, that's what I was getting at. I didn't want everybody to start at the first sentence and go duplicate everything. Okay, yeah, fine. In fact, I think there might be more of a duplication if I do my testimony and then we go through the uh, okay. go through the letter itself. So. Do you want to start with Mr. Miller or Mr. Taylor? Yeah, we comments. can start with Mr. Nope. Miller's letter. Can we just have him move the, the easel over to the side so the public can see it too? Because we've got it in front of us. Okay, yeah, would you mind doing that? Could you just move, move over so to the side there so that they can see it because we have it in front of us, but yeah. the, the public can't see it. Thank you. Good suggestion. Then I can see all their faces too. <laughs> and then just turn it towards the audience. Let them. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, we were, we were trying to um, be respectful and stay back behind the uh, behind the uh, podium. Podium, yeah. And that's why we brought the exhibits over next to the podium. But we'll try to we'll try to. Shop okay, over. thank you. Yeah, it's just, yeah I, we're going to let the folks in the audience be able to see what we're looking yeah, at. Sure. Yeah, I tend to like to point it at the exhibit when I'm well, testifying. You can use Marty's. Okay, that'd be fine. Do you, you don't mind? Yeah, you want to use grab that one right there? Grab that one. I think Marty's. that one's okay. Um, so, so the original, the, the first, the first exhibit I brought up when, when I started my testimony, I should have indicated that that was uh, A6 that was presented at, at the February meeting. Um, I'm not sure what the next number is, but then A9. A9. So what we have here is um, a color rendering of the site plan. It shows the updated. Um, changes to the site layout. Okay, now you wanted to go over the letter, the comments and the letters. Do you want Mr. Taylor's first or Mr. Miller? I think we can do Mr. Miller's first. Um, he, his letter was dated March 30th, uh, 2023. And what I'll do is just touch on the, the various items that pertain to the site, site related uh, comments. So on, on page two of Mr. Miller's letter uh, under site plan, um, item number two, uh, talked about um, one of the variances we're requesting is that um, although um, the type of uses on, on, of this application aren't specifically spelled out in the ordinance pertaining to parking requirements, um, both uh, our office and, and your professionals um, had, had tried to interpret those, those regulations to determine that 44 parking spaces were required for, for this use for this site. And what we're proposing, we're asking for a variance to permit 36 uh, parking spaces uh, for the proposed uses, both the primary and the ancillary uses um, that we're proposing this evening. And uh, to support that variance, um, in, the, in the previous testimony uh, we did back in February, we indicated that we felt based on um, we felt 29 spaces were needed uh, for these particular uses based on uh, the facts that uh, one, the various uses, uh, the primary use, which is the house of worship, and then all the ancillary uses, which is the fellowship center, the food pantry, the code blue. Um, those type of uses um, are at all different times during the course of the week. Uh, on different days during the course of the week, um, so they don't conflict with each other. And we felt that 29 spaces based on um, the employee count and the traffic study that the Shropshire's office had previously done, I'm sorry, the parking study that they did um, for the uh, food pantry use, uh, we determined that 29 spaces were required. However, uh, we have gone through the effort to increase it. 
um, by again extending the parking lot in the rear and adding a couple spaces in the front of the facility. Um, for item number three, uh, the, it's been determined that um, a 24 foot wide um, drive aisle along the front of the uh, parking for the front parking uh, is required. Previously, we proposed 22. Uh, it's still currently shown at 22, but we can increase that um, by a couple feet. We'll extend it a little closer to um, uh, New Jersey State Highway Route 38 to make a 24 foot wide drive aisle. That is a one way circulation in that in that particular uh, area. But we'll make it 24 feet to um, enhance the uh, backing out maneuver for the parking spaces along the front of the front building. <coughs> in doing so, we are encroaching a little bit more by a couple feet into um, the 25 foot landscape buffer that runs along uh, New Jersey State Highway 38, but we've already we're already encroaching on that uh, with the two additional parking spaces that replace the uh, dumpster area that was previously proposed in the front. Under still under site plan um, number four. Uh, again, we are we are still asking for a waiver on the uh, um, loading area uh, requirement. Um, again, um, the deliveries are going to be, um, they, they can be scheduled during um, times when the other uses are not operating um, and we have a lot of parking lot area uh, for any kind of delivery vehicle to, uh, to park um, and, and deliver any kind of items. Could you just so, uh, refresh my recollection on um, how the, uh, the inventory of the food comes in, what size trucks are involved? They, yeah, they would all be uh, your, your box type of trucks, your vans, and your box type of vehicles, like uh, sort of like your U-Haul uh, type of vehicles. No, There's no tractor trailers are proposed for this, for this type of use. And, and the trucks come in at what I'll call off hours, that is the hours other than um, when uh, participants are present for a service or that is use. that is correct a lot of the, a lot of the functions are only like in the span of a couple hours or four hours for example the food pantry was during Fridays from from nine to one o'clock of course your Saturday or your Sunday service rather is, is only a, a couple hours so things like that so it's dispersed throughout the course of the week and there's plenty of opportunities um, to, to work around those schedules so deliveries can be scheduled so as not to conflict conflict with any of those uses correct Uh, continuing on page three, um, item number 11 pertains to um, some stabilization. Uh, just to um, go through the drainage, what happens is currently the drainage runs um, from the eastern, easterly um, property line, side yard property line, and then goes to the westerly side where the drainage corridor is. Pretty much it splits uh, to the rear and to the front. So we're maintaining that uh, drainage pattern. Um, when we get to the um, westerly end of the parking lots, we have uh, depressed curbs to um, uh, dis discharge the stormwater on both the front and the rear um, of the parking areas, and they will be um, armored with riprap and stone and, uh, to um, reduce the potential of, of erosion. And then we'll also make sure, we'll do the analysis to make sure that the, those openings and, and that swale area can accommodate that runoff. Is that the area that you're talking about that you have to get the um, approval from DEP? Um, it, it's close to those areas, yeah, but that's not, we don't have to get approval from DEP for that, those particular items because they are outside the regulated areas. Okay. Yeah. Well, with the exception of, uh, actually the one is going to be within the, uh, um, the fill area, the general permit that we need to get from DEP for, for both the parking lot at the rear uh, and where the dumpster location is and also where that discharge point is in, at the rear of the property. So that's all affiliated with that one general permit that we need to get from, from the state. 
Um, item number 13 pertains to water and gas services. We will provide um, that information um, on our plan. And then number 14, again, number 14 also um, pertains to those uh, curb cuts uh, and the discharge points from the drainage from the parking areas. On page four, Mr. Miller has some new comments. Um, number 18 at the top pertains to the uh, letter of interpretation uh, that we discussed. And as I indicated, in addition to the letter of interpretation that's going to verify the wetlands that we had delineated, we also need to get um, general permit um, for the filling of that swale in the back of the area. Uh, there's also, a, we also indicate a 50 foot buffer of the wetlands. Uh, that will be part of the verification from J NJDEP. Also, we, we've kept it, we're keeping all the improvements outside of that, that buffer area. In addition, in addition to our general permits, we're also um, in, uh, currently the, the facility is um, serviced by an on-site septic system. But for, for the proposed facility, we are going to um, uh, provide public connection into the uh, Mount Holly um, um, um public sewer system. And we'll have a, a pump station at the rear of the uh, one-story building. And we'll be pumping that out along uh, Route 38 to a manhole that's uh, just west of the uh, property. So in doing so, um, we'll need some uh, permitting from NJDEP uh, to, because we will actually be cutting through some of the uh, wetland buffer areas um, that have been established. Um, item number 20 pertains um, to the um, split level home that we're going to be demolished. We just have to label that on um, on our plans and we are will, we will willing to do so. Um, item number uh, 21 pertains again to that wetland buffer. It is not delineated on our lighting and landscaping plan. Uh, so we will uh, definitely show that on the plan also. Um, item number 22 pertains to um, some of the um, gutter grades, uh, particularly along the front parking lot area. What we would provide it was a um, combination concrete curb and gutter and then a concrete swale uh, coming across the exit drive. Um, those grades are relatively flat, so that's why we proposed uh, concrete, because it's a lot easier um, to construct uh, to, to a little more accurately to the proposed grades when they're that flat. Uh, we will try to, um, and I have discussed this with uh, Mr. Miller's office, try to elevate those grades a little bit um, to accommodate a little better slope in those areas. Um, item number 23 is just a missed spot elevation that we will provide. Um, item number 24 pertains to the concrete parking bumpers. We're proposing the concrete bumpers along the uh, parking spaces um, on the easterly side of the property. Um, and there's a detail that uh, we have to improve the reinforced uh, pins uh, for those concrete bumpers. So we'll provide that. And then item number 25 pertains to um, the ADA parking spaces in the front of the property. Um, we will need to provide trunca truncated domes uh, where, those, where the um, access goes into the paved area. So we will do that also. Then item on page five, item number 28 pertains to uh, the approvals, particularly outside agency approvals. Again, we will also uh, uh, need the county approval. We'll need the now the MUA approval. Um, and um, of course, the permits from NJDEP and also the soil conservation, soil conservation district. So those are some additional approvals that we'll need uh, for this project. Then items 20, 29 through 31, they all pertain to um, cleanup items and uh, we will comply with those requirements. Um, so for, for Mr. Miller's letter, that's um, all we have on that. 
So I will move to uh, Mr. Taylor's letter of April 3rd, 2023. Um, can I just interrupt you for one second, Councillor? On your next witnesses that are going to come up, we don't have to go through the letter in detail. If you're going to comply, you're going to comply with their request. That's it. Okay, fair enough. And we just want to speed things up here. Got it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Same thing with going to Mr. Taylor's letter. Yes, okay. Thank you. We'll do. Um, Mr. Taylor's letter, I'd like to go in a little more detail, however, because I just want to re familiarize everybody with the, with the various uh, variances and design waivers uh, that we're going through. Um, so, um, so let me start off. This is the April 3rd letter, correct? That is correct. So on page three, item C, which is the zoning variances and waivers, um, item number one, although uh, I defer, of course, to um, our uh, pl professional planner. But item number two, um, I just want to bring up item number two, it pertains to um, changes in uh, side yard setback. Before we had an existing uh, non-conforming condition with the uh, split level home, it was uh, like 15 feet from the west early property line. Uh, your side yard setback requirement is 25 feet. So with the elimination of that, uh, we eliminate that non-conforming use. We're now the closest um, building to the property line is the two-story uh, building in the rear, and that's uh, over 48 uh, feet from the side property line. So that, that um, non-conforming condition has been eliminated. Item number three uh, through four, I'm sorry, three through five uh, pertains to um, the required 20-foot um, parking setback from the rear and side property lines. Um, with the um, with the situation of the building, the existing building, particularly the two-story building in the rear, um, and its relationship to the rear and side property lines, we made a, a number of, of variances um, for uh, the again parking setback. Uh, 20 foot is required from the rear and side property lines. Um, we have. <laughs> Uh, enough room to provide a four-foot setback along the easterly side property line uh, for the parking. We have um, a five-foot setback from the rear property line for the parking spaces. And then we have a one-foot setback for a little uh, slot to provide um, a little bit of maneuvering uh, for the drive aisle. Um, so, so we have those setbacks in lieu of the 20-foot setback. We're asking for a variance for the four, five, and one foot setbacks. Where you're asking for, for the setbacks, what is, what's on the other side of your property line? How okay. Going to be? For the easterly property line, you have um, the uh, uh, business um, adjacent to it. Uh, you have, you probably have about 40 feet or 35, 40 feet between of the building and the property line. Um, we are proposing uh, some landscape screen screening and also a uh, solid PVC vinyl fence to, uh, to create a buffer to mitigate that to help mitigate that encroachment. In the rear of the property, um, there's uh, that wooded area that separates. Actually, let me pull up. This is an aerial. Aerial of the um, site that's outlined in red, um, and um, so you can see the uh, the uh, building uh, to the easterly side, and then there's the wooded area that separates the rear of the property and the the um, adjoining property owner's parking lot. So there's a wooded area in, in, in within there that uh, creates that separation. Again, we're also proposing uh, a solid PVC vinyl fence in that area too to help mitigate. Um, that encroachment. Also, um, the lighting for those parking areas, the site lighting, we have, um, because the uh, pole mounted site lights are right there, um, you know, in between, uh, we have cutoffs. We're proposing cutoffs for those light fixtures so that the light does not, uh, not very much light encroaches onto the adjoining uh, property. 
So we're mitigating that that concern also. Can you can you just where is it that it's going to be located? What a foot from the rear lot line? Yeah, that's in the uh, the drive aisle on the easterly side of yeah. the property. That goes up to about a foot to the to the rear property line. And what that does is we just want to provide a little more maneuvering uh, for that last parking space to back out. So that's why we have that one foot uh, encroachment. So the whole back line is a foot, right? Is that what you're saying? The no, no, no. It's just so for the for the uh, excuse me for the seven parking spaces along the rear, you have a five foot setback, and then for the drive aisle, you have a one foot setback, and then for the rest of the remaining the remaining rear and along the easterly side, you have a four foot setback. Gotcha. Where 20 foot is required. Where 20 foot is required um, at, on both along the rear and the sides. Yeah, one other clarification you mentioned in response to Mrs. Tindale's question. On the eastern part of the property line, you said there's going to be about 45 feet? There's, let, me, let me judge. I think it might be more 35, but let me. Oh, I, okay, 35. We're I do have a scale, but yeah. yeah but, the, but that's not the property that you're involved in, that's somebody else's property. That's correct, yeah. You yeah, I was just from the building. I was just indicating from the building to uh, let me just double check from the building to the property line. <coughs> I'm sorry, we have it's actually about 27 feet. Yeah, 27 feet. I apologize. So from the building, so the building to the property line is 27 feet, and then we have the additional four feet. That's the difference. Okay, so f the other building requires 20 feet. They have 27. That's uh, well, yeah, they don't have any room here to put any kind of parking facilities in here. But yeah, it's from their building uh, to the property line. But they're not asking for anything. No, no, no. But, but you're, just, you're asking for four feet from the property line where 20 is required. That is correct. That's correct. I just wanted to get it clarified. Yeah. Um, item number six, um, a variance is required to permit an accessory structure, which in this case it's a shed, uh, to be located five feet from the proposed ki kitchen addition. Um, and that is in this location, of course, here in red is the proposed kitchen addition. Uh, also, the uh, shed is also in red. Uh, we have a distance of a, about five feet in between the two. We do have a 10 foot separation from the shed to the two story, but we have this encroachment in here. Um, I'd still like to ask for the variance, but we will attempt to um, move. Uh, currently, I can move the, the shed back toward the rear property line to create a 10-foot separation. But I'd, I'd still like to keep the variance, and I'll do, we'll do that. But what we have is we do have the wetlands and the stream corridor, and we have the 50-foot buffer. Um, if that has to change any slightly after we get approval from the NJDEP, that might impact this. Um, the uh, shed, so I'd like to at least have that variance to have a little, have a little leeway in case we, we can't accommodate that 10 feet. But if, but if we can, we will. We'll, we'll get that 10 foot separation uh, between those two facilities. Item number seven um, pertains to uh, item number seven A uh, pertains to um, 50 foot wide uh, buffer along the westerly property line. Again, and we provide testimony on this before, but I'll refresh. Um, we're not proposing a, a buffer, although or at least a landscape buffer. We're keeping it as a lawn area. Oops, we just go back. Just keeping it as a lawn area in here. Um, but we do have, as indicated before, we have over uh, 400 feet of buffer from a wooded buffer. So it's substantial. Um, that's it, part of the uh, drainage corridor uh, that's to the west of the site. So the, just to complete the thought, the, the drainage buffer um, being a wetlands condition is such that you wouldn't have construction on that. Computer. That's correct. It's all regulated. Um, in fact, it's regulated on our site too with, with the wetland. Well, there's no wetlands, but the buffer is on our site. 
uh, in that particular location with the exception of that finger that comes in uh, to the rear. But that's correct. It's all regulated so there won't be any construction, any removal of trees or any of that nature uh, within that within that stream corridor. How about how, I'm sure it varies, but approximately how wide is the stream corridor? Well, they, for, for the wooded area that we the show on, that's shown on the uh, uh, area, so I if I take the, um, the, the closest spot from uh, our site to uh, the adjoining residential area, we've got over 400 feet. So from the rear, from the rear property, I'd say, um, just going straight west, we have about 400 feet, which is the most narrow uh, portion of that stream corridor. Along our along our westerly property line. So who owns that uh, upper property uh, with the wooded area? Uh, I do believe it's it's part of the um, the residential development. So you'd have to get approval from them to go through that that condition. No, we have to get approval from NJDOT for that because we're we're um, our, our force meeting is going to be within the right of way. There is a uh, there is a um, sanitary it's a gravity sanitary line that comes out to uh, to Route 38 and that's what we're tying into in that into that manhole. Sir, I think you made a mistake. You need the B from DEP, not DOT. Uh, well, we need both. We need since we're running the force main along the state highway within their right of way, we we'll need their um, we will need their approval to do so. Um, and in addition to that. Uh, this this force main is going to be cutting through some of the wetland buffers associated with that stream corridor, and since we're cutting through the buffer area, we'll need a we'll need a general permit from NJDEP. Thank you. Um, continuing under uh, 7B with when we briefly discussed this uh, previously about the 25 foot buffer. Uh, sc screening along Route 38. Uh, of course, we are providing um, some street trees and some um, buffers, uh, some uh, shrubbery buffers for that. Um, we want it. There are some areas where we're not for safety reasons, for site site visibility and, and things of that nature. Um, so, uh, so we're asking for uh, approval, basically, for the uh, landscaping that we show on our plans. And just one point of clarification while we're on that, Mark. And with the two-foot widening of the drive aisle, that the physical dimension will actually be reduced down to 23 feet. That's right? correct. And actually, uh, with the uh, two parking spaces, I believe that even is reduced further. That um, the one parking space totally encroaches, and portion of the other parking space encroaches. Uh, that I believe is around 13 feet. Right. Okay. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. So uh, for item 7C, continuing, uh, we talk about um, the, uh, again, another variance um, that's required with regards to um, the width of the drive aisle. Uh, we did talk about the one in the front from 22 to 24 feet. The um, two-way traffic along the easterly side and the, um, the rear of the property, the two-way drive aisle, requires a 25-foot width. Um, we're proposing 24, again, so we can uh, navigate within the provided areas between the existing building and the existing property lines. Um, item D, we covered with regards to the 22-foot wide uh, drive aisle. We will increase that to 24 feet. Um, uh, item E, 7E, we talked about the loading area, um, and uh, so we're asking for variance of, from providing a specified loading area. Um, item F, again, um, we're asking for um, a waiver from the 44 parking space requirement where we're providing 36. Item 7G um, says to provide sidewalks as required by when in section 104-121, um, what we did is we saw, uh, we checked that ordinance, um, and it does say that um, a sidewalk is required that is consistent with the prevailing community standards in the area. 
And as you can see, um, as you can see, um, the prevailing sidewalk in the area, of course, there is none. No sidewalk in there, so we're asking for uh, a waiver on that requirement. Um, let's see, uh, items uh, on page four, comments D, really items um, two through eight we can comply with. Um, just want to clarify, let's see. Uh, we already talked about that. Uh, oh, um, item number five, D5, talks about um, whether uh, outdoor amenities um, are, are proposed, but w there are no outdoor amenities proposed with regards to this application. Uh, just clarifying on item number eight, the, uh, we're proposing the fence, the areas to be fenced in um, from uh, a portion of the easterly property line all the way to the rear, um, along the westerly property line, and then tying back into the to the one-story building. Um, again, the intent is to um, just um, keep within the area, run along the existing woods line. <coughs> excuse me, woods line along the westerly side, and then of course along the property line to the rear, and then along and providing an additional buffer along the easterly property line with that fence. Yes. Okay, on number 8A, we have the notice that says the perimeter fence is supposed to be installed over an earth canal. Yeah, the grades in this area, well, we're taking out the, um, the uh, uh, split level building, and in front of that, you have a big mounded area that went up to the front door of that split level area. And it's also a mounded area for a very large evergreen tree that's in the front that we're proposing to remain. Um, so that, that mound created, once we take down the building, will be back down to grade, uh, and it's elevated in the front. So there's a little bit of a mound in here. The fence does run, uh, it pretty much skims the bottom of that mounded area of the tree. So, um, we, so it's suggested that we move back um, the, the fence line along the front, uh, and we can do that. We only need to move it a, a few feet, like three feet, to to avoid that mound. Although it probably could go over the mound. It's not. It's we're pretty much at the Toa slope, and that's shown on our grading plan. So, but we can move it back just to, you know, eliminate that. That's correct. Oh no, you're going to be back down to grade. Yeah, it was only like a, a foot or two difference in elevation, and then it goes back down. And then you have the fence showing around the perimeter over here, and you're saying that there's possible wetlands? Yeah, we, we, do, we will have to permit for this fence, too. That's all going to be That's part of our application. So you should have requirements that you cannot put in yeah. those screens? That's correct. That's, That's correct. Make sure that um, that is addressed from the DEP that you have the fence on there so that. So that, just in case, because, yeah, we're not sure if they will put concrete or not, but in case they do, that's going to be part of our application to NJDP, just to cover it so there's no issues um, back there. But you are correct. Mr. Malinkowski, can we go back to the sidewalk? Where, where are you proposing sidewalks? Uh, we are proposing sidewalks along the front proper, uh, parking lot. Right. And um, and along, of course, the opposite side of the easterly parking lot, and of course into the into the little courtyard between the two-story and the one building, the one-story building uh, for ADA access. I think that what what we're asking the the relief from was providing parking or uh, sidewalk along the frontage of the property. Okay, now it's but the food bank is the last building, right? The food bank area, the processing and all is, is done at the, in the two-story building in the rear. But no sidewalk on the easterly side of that building? Uh, along the east, no, that's correct, no sidewalk there. The reason I'm asking is it's reported that on the Fridays when they're doing the food distribution, the, the people line the sidewalk. And I'm kind of asking what uh, sidewalk. Yeah, I believe the testimony um, uh, was that the, the, the 
for the food, the food and clothes distribution, there'll be parking along the parking spaces, and those products will be brought out um, to those people in, in carts and all, and and um, loaded into the vehicles at that location. <coughs> and and it, we can have um, we can have the applicant test, you know, further testify on that so, operation. So that's what that's what you're doing. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Yes. Um, one of the other, just um, on, on, on item 8B, we do propose, um, of course, we're, we're talking about the fence along the rear property line. We do propose a uh, double gate in the back, and the purpose of that is um, to provide access. There is a, a fire hydrant on the adjoining property that's just, just to the rear of that uh, gate. So we're providing that gate in case the fire district needs access to that fire hydrant. Uh, let's see, I'm just... Mark, jumping back to number two, we kind of, you kind of said we'll comply on two through eight. In terms of parking analysis, um, will there be any follow-up discussion or other testimony on that? Um, I, I think we did pretty much cover that before with regards, uh, of course, on our plans, we have the hours of operation for the various uses, uh, both the um, principal use and the, and the ancillary uses. Um, and, um, and we have previously provided uh, uh, testimony with the, with regards to their hours of operation. So those those um, hours of operation have not changed since the um, since the uh, last meeting. So, okay. So, sir, can I go back to the sidewalk a minute? You're proposing a sidewalk. You're proposing no sidewalks in front of the parking lot. Is that correct? We're proposing no sidewalk along the frontage of the property. So along Rule 38, we're proposing no sidewalk, but we are proposing sidewalk on the front uh, along the uh, parking space for access into the building, into the buildings, actually. But, but no sidewalks to the eastern side of the food bank? With the exception of um, between the, the two-story and the one-story building, we're providing sidewalk along there. We're just not providing sidewalk along that one side of the two-story building. That's what I just said. Yeah. The entire eastern side of the food bank. Correct. No sidewalk. Correct. There's there's very limited room in there. So uh, one of the things, um, uh, one of the comments from, from Mr. Taylor was providing some foundation um, uh, um, landscaping uh, along that easterly side of the uh, two-story building. So it break up the monotony of it. You want to use the microphone, please? Uh, to clarify, I know that you, you've asked a couple of times about parking on the eastern side of <clears throat> that building um, where the uh, food pantry operation will occur on a limit, excuse me, on a limited basis each week. Um, as uh, the testimony was that um, at this location, um, the um, clients coming for uh, food items will be serviced by uh, staff, Beacon of Hope staff, while the clients remain in their cars. Clients won't um, be coming into the building to uh, pick up food items. Uh, they will pull into the parking um, spot, uh, spots, uh, stop their cars, and then staff will come out and load the food into their cars. So there's no need for them to um, to to get out. So just just to be clear uh, about the extent to which um, clients will be, um, uh, uh, you know, moving through the parking area and perhaps needing a sidewalk on the side of that building. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we did cover um, items uh, 9 through 11 on page uh, 5 uh, with previous testimony. Um, 
Item number 12 is just a little more detailed coordination between the site plans and the architectural plans with regards to building entrances and such. Um, items 13, um, we will comply. Um, items um, under um, E, which is sign comments. Uh, item number two, uh, uh, Mr. Teller asked for um, the color of the frame of the sign. Of course, as we indicated before, there's an existing uh, pylon sign um, in the um, southeast uh, corner of the site. Uh, we are just refurbishing the copy on that. Uh, currently, the post and the frame of the sign is painted black, and, and we will continue uh, with that color. It will be repainted uh, in a black color. Um, uh, just indicating, um, of course, no, under E3, again, just uh, re-indicating that no wall signs are proposed uh, under this application. And under lighting and um, F, uh, number, I'll jump down to number two. Um, with regards to light fixtures, um, there is a miscount. We have um, four, uh, what we refer to as F2 uh, light fixtures um, that are the majority of the fixtures, um, both along the rear and the easterly side, and also on the westerly side of the parking lot. Uh, so there's four of those, and then the F1 fixture is the one right directly in the front, and we have one of those. Um, item number three pertains to the type of fixtures. They are full cutoff LED uh, light fixtures, and the ones that are along the property lines will have uh, backlight cutoffs so that they don't um, impede on the uh, adjoining property. Um, jumping to um, page six under H landscaping comments. Um, again, we are provi pro providing uh, four street trees along the frontage. Uh, we would typically provide more, but then we're trying to maintain uh, the large um, evergreen tree uh, that is in the um, southwest corner of the site. That takes up quite a bit of room, um, so there really is no room for, for additional trees in that area. Um, for, so, um, I mean, number one, uh, going back, there is an existing um, uh, electrical service to the uh, one-story building in the front. It, it's above, it's overhead line, um, and it will interfere with the uh, proposed landscaping that's proposed in the front, so we'll have to um, put that service underground, and we will indicate that. Item number two uh, pertains to um, uh, some trees that are going to be removed. Uh, we do have um, a tree in the front um, that is right next to the uh, split level home. Um, it's like a, only a few feet away, so when that home gets demolished, that tree won't survive, won't survive that demolition. So that will be removed. And then we do have a couple trees in the rear of the property um, that uh, will need to be removed to accommodate the parking spaces in the rear. Um, so in order to um, accommodate those losses, we will provide the three uh, trees that are, re are required to have a three-inch caliber. So we'll replace, um, we'll replace those trees that are being lost. Um, item number three uh, pertains to um, tree protection. Again, uh, we want to protect the tree in the front and then any remaining trees in the rear of the property. Um, well, the proposed development is pretty close, so we are proposing um, tree protection, protection fencing, which is indicated uh, on the soil erosion plan of the uh, site plan set. Um, so we have that information on the plans. Um, and then uh, we'll also indicate, um, and we'll add a note to the plans indicating that um, the layout of the fence uh, will be staked out prior to construction for, for approval. Again, the attempt is not to do any additional clearing. It's just to, for the fence line to follow the existing woods line, with the exception of the uh, modification made in the back for the uh, proposed um, parking lot. And then lastly, item number four pertains to site triangles. Uh, there will be a site triangle at the uh, 
at the exit of 138. Uh, and if we need to, we'll, we'll show that site triangle and adjust the uh, location of the front landscaping as necessary to accommodate that, uh, that triangle. And uh, that concludes uh, the review of your professional's letters. Okay, thank you. The board has any questions? No. Yes, Mr. Duke. So I just have a handful, real quick. I see that you're putting a 284 square foot kitchen in that location right there. That's correct, the landfill. Between both buildings, is there access to both those buildings via a door in that kitchen? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, second, is that 280 square foot addition subject? This goes to the attorneys to COA. Will that be subject to a COA fee uh, on that new building? I believe that uh, our ordinance exempt, exempts places of worship from COA fees. Okay. And then uh, lastly is just one is on the um, the shed. It's a 12 by 20 shed. Do we have a height on that by chance? Yet? Um, yeah, I think we do. Uh, let me double check on that. I think it's 12, but let me confirm that. And then what is the, is the shed being used for? I see it's close to the kitchen. So yeah, it's just um, you know, for your typical maintenance equipment and things like that. It is 12, Mark. The plans indicate 12. Yeah. 12? Yes, 12 feet. Okay, thanks much. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Councilor, who's next? Uh, any, any other questions at this time for our engineer? Oh, I think we did it. Okay, very good. Um, then we're going to call back up our architect, Kent Werner of JRP Architects, to provide you with um, uh, an overview of the amended plans for his standpoint. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you to the public for being here. Thank you. Uh, as Mr. Malinowski pointed out, um, the major change to the uh, building layout is that we have uh, deleted the split level residence. Um, the majority of the house of worship functions uh, already occurred in uh, what we're calling building two and building three. Um, the kitchen that was in building one has been relocated as per the previous discussion. And the uh, Beacon of Hope operations offices as well as the uh, offices for uh, the pastor, etc., already are existing in these spaces. Um, if I could, I'll go through um, a couple of the comments in the uh, Taylor Design Group letter uh, that Mr. Malinowski did not touch on. Um, let's see. Uh, item number 14 uh, is in regards to an air conditioning unit attached to the rear of the front building. Uh, all of the existing air conditioning units will be demolished as part of the uh, construction documents that we will prepare. Um, <coughs> those um, new air conditioning units are proposed uh, and they will be located behind um, building two and beside building three. Um, not in any of the areas that are uh, outside of building setbacks, etc. Um, um, let's see, that was question 14. Um, comment number 13, Mr. Malinowski uh, addressed it, but I will say that we will provide uh, accessible uh, routes um, to the doors. Uh, I'm sorry, you had asked about um, an accessible route from the parking area to this uh, corridor, which already exists between the two buildings to a new door into the kitchen addition, and then we would also have an exit door out of, out of the kitchen here. Uh, this is an existing door uh, from building two. Uh, we'll be maintaining the existing doors from building two. Um, 
that are, are here. And um, details will be provided for the uh, in response to uh, comment number 15. Uh, details will be provided in the construction permit documents for the stairs, decks, and railings. Um, just touching briefly on the lighting comments, um, uh, required lighting information will be provided and we will coordinate with Mr. Malinowski in regards to photometrics uh, and cutoffs for any of the exterior light fixtures. And I believe that's it. We're demolishing uh, the footprint of the existing residence is approximately 1,300 square feet. The infill for the kitchen is approximately 300 square feet. And I believe that's it. Any questions for our architect? No. Any questions? Uh, Board? Yes, ma'am. So, the size of these buildings and the pieces of them, are they going to be sprinkler? We are proposing a limited area of sprinkler on the second floor of, of this building, uh, building three. <coughs> yes. What size of the existing buildings? Uh, they're under 3,000 square feet. I believe it's uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of third. Uh, shoot. I don't have I don't have the figure in front of me. So the building that is going to be used uh, proposed for the code blue. Yes. Okay. So is that still going to be two stories where we'll be sleeping upstairs? No. Upstairs? No. The the code blue occurs on the first floor only, okay. and we propose uh, to to provide a horizontal separation between the second floor space and the first floor space by adding um, fire resistant material. What is the second floor going to be used for? Second floor is going to be used for food pantry storage and for a uh, break area for staff. So there's no elevators that are going to be needed. I know we discussed that at one of the first. We're, we're proposing a uh, chairlift, but because of this, the square foot requirements, it's uh, under 3,000 square feet. Okay. Um, so we're technically not required to have an elevator, um, but we are proposing a, a an outdoor lift that will be enclosed. Um, for moving moving items up into that area. There is a means of egress on the second floor to an, an existing stair that will be maintained. And then uh, just one last question. The new code section that on March 6 for public buildings, has the bathrooms been taken into consideration for the new ABA requirements? Um, I believe we will be, I will re-examine really those in regards to the ch changes to the turning radii and mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, which could affect your interior of the Yes, I believe I did have one of the staff take a look at that, but we will be adjusting that prior to submission for permit. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions for our No, I don't think so. Can I just ask someone to mark that A10? Can of course. A10? Sure thing. Oh, I didn't get to show you my pretty pictures. <laughs> If you want, there's the 3D views of the parking lot area and whatnot. They may help in further testimony. You want to show them now? Sure. Yeah. That would be A11. <laughs> Just um, walk through, okay. Um, uh, this is the fence that Mr. Malinowski was talking about in regards to that area where we have the earthen mound um, that'll be cut down when the uh, split level is demolished. This is uh, the extent of building number two. This is building number three. You can see a little bit of the roof of the 12 foot high shed there. Um, and we have a, a couple of other views as one would walk around the site. Uh, a little bit more of an aerial view, similar to the larger view. Um, this is a view from the rear of the site. 
where you're, you're looking at the um, side parking area, the dumpster enclosure. Actually, wait a second. No, this, I'm sorry, this is looking from the west. Um, so we've got the dumpster enclosure. This is the, the lawn area that we spoke of with the shed and the area in between the two buildings. Um, this is looking from uh, as if you were standing on the roof of the adjacent building, um, looking at the, the added rear parking, the side parking, and the area between the two buildings. And then this is uh, from the front of the site. Can I ask you to mark each of those in turn? I think we had 8, 10, and then 11, and 12. We need to mark each of these pages. Of course. Sure. Okay. Councilor, we have all of these drawings here, the board. Understood. We just want to make sure that we get everything on the record. Okay. okay. Um, any more questions? Any additional questions for our architects at this time? No. Okay. Moving on to um, our traffic engineer to update the testimony, his testimony, Nate Mosley of Shropshire. This, this is going to be additional information? Correct. This is an update based on the change. No, no repetition. Correct. We all paid attention for the last two meetings. We all paid attention for the last two meetings. I'll be brief. No? Good. Thank you. Sure. Again, just for the record, my name is Nathan Mosley. I'm a licensed professional engineer. I'm a partner with Shropshire Associates, and we prepared a parking analysis that was submitted dated um, January 19, 2023. So you've already heard all the uh, explanation about the changes to the plan. The main difference with regards to the parking, obviously, is that we've been able to increase the overall parking supply for this project. Uh, we've also reduced some of the building square footage that's on the site as well. So now instead of having 24 total parking spaces, we have 36 total parking spaces. I'm sorry, 29 total parking spaces previously. And we now have 36 total parking spaces for an increase of seven spaces on site. And that was accommodated through the new parking in the rear of the property. Um, the original study that we submitted uh, evaluated the overall parking demands. It was determined that the peak parking demand for the various uses, the primary house of worship and the other ancillary uses, would be on Friday when the food pantry operations are occurring. And then there's also just general employees that will be on the property as well. It was anticipated based upon the study that we did at the existing facility in Mount Holly, uh, as well as the number of employees for the proposed site, that there would be a total peak parking demand of 24 spaces. Uh, we saw 15 spaces uh, at the peak time for the existing food pantry operation. And that did include employees that were there as well, as well as the delivery vehicle that was at that site. But to be conservative, we just kind of double counted as, as needed to, to look at it from a conservative perspective. So again, before we had 24 spaces um, as the peak parking demand, whereas we had a 29 space parking supply, which in my opinion was sufficient. However, there were some concerns. So we've obviously done everything we can to maximize the parking. And I believe that this proposed parking will obviously increase the supply and we'll be able to provide for more safe <coughs> parking on the site. Um, the one thing I will say, um, you know, there was questions about what happens if the food pantry gets busier, things like that from a parking perspective. So we have 36 total spaces and we take away nine of those spaces for just the employees that will be on the site on a day-to-day -day, uh, operations, whether they're working in the food pantry or the pastors on site, or there's somebody else just there for maintenance uh, purposes, that would still leave 27 parking spaces just for the food pantry customers or clients. 
if we assume that all this all the parking that we observed in Mount Holly was for the clients which was 15 total vehicles at, at peak time that still would allow for an increase of nearly 80 percent in activity levels while still being able to accommodate that parking need on this property with the 36 total spaces so even if the pantry um, clientele increases as a result of a need or a demand that occurs it's my opinion that with the 36 parking spaces that we have proposed it will still be more than sufficient to accommodate an increase in demand or operations with the food pantry uh, without having any issues where people are parking on the street or not being able to find a parking space on the site and that's all i wanted to say if there's any other questions let me know I think you made the parking worse. Couldn't? Say again? I think you made the parking worse by adding more spots because now it's going to kill even more cars are going to back up while the other ones are trying to get by. Okay. There's, not, there's no two directions here. All right, just, is that, is that what you wanted? That's my comment. Okay, I, just for the benefit of the folks in the audience, because we've asked and you guys have been great for the last two meetings, um, Mr. McLaughlin is on the board. We just don't have enough seats up here. And that's why the... Pardon? I can't vote, but I can make no. a comment. Uh, no, that's right, but you are on the board. Yes. But that's, I just wanted the audience to know that so that everybody doesn't start yelling out. Um, may, I, may I speak um, briefly? I, I, I'd like to object to Mr. McLaughlin's um, continued comments. Um, it, it's our perspective, uh, mine in particular, that Mr. McLaughlin has prejudged this application. Uh, from the beginning, from the outset. Um, so, hold it, hold it, please. I'll be ha uh, happy, happy to repeat that. No, it's not necessary. Your objections noted, and let's move on. Okay. okay. I, I, I would like. Um, we're, we're noting that for the record, and I think Mr. McLaughlin should not be permitted. Um, to continue to assail this application uh, through to its conclusion. Okay. I think that's inappropriate. Uh, again, your points noted, and I'm the one that would make that decision, and I'm making the decision. He's welcome to participate with this board. Okay, who's, you said you're completed, right? I have nothing else unless there's any other questions. Okay. I have a question, uh, Mr. Mosley. I had requested a copy of the DOT application that was submitted. Were you able to obtain that and provide that? Yeah, we have a copy of the approved letter of no interest from DOT, which, which indicated they reviewed the proposed development and they indicate that the access points or can be maintained as they are today for the proposed change in use. I can provide a copy of that if, if that's needed. No, what I had asked the last meeting and you had agreed to was uh, providing me a copy or the board a copy of the actual application that was made to DOT. <laughs> okay, sure, I can provide you with a copy of the submitted request. Yeah. It was, it was a letter package that was submitted for the requested letter of no interest, as it's called. There's not a formal application form. Okay. Well, whatever I was can, submitted yeah, to DOT to receive the no further the NFA from them. Sure. Okay. No problem. I can email you a copy. Thank you, right. sir. Thank just, you. I have one, and I, Ms. Edwards, I don't know if it's for Mr. Mosley or somebody else. Uh, one of the other items I noted that was asked at the last meeting um, relative to the p sort of parking issue is um, to identify the maximum number of wedding or event attendees is that something uh, i don't have an answer on that one directly i think we touched on that because that i think the parking is sort of the recurring concern here and obviously if there was a, a wedding for 300 folks we have an issue so i i think trying to quantify and i think i think what was testified to is that that we were not going to do uh, large events, and if I recall correctly, although feel free to um, feel free to um, uh, counter what I'm about to say, I believe we said that um, we would be willing to limit the number of on-site guests for any um, for any event. 
that we held. I mean, obviously, we don't. We want our site to function. Right. We don't want to have events where our site doesn't function. Nobody benefits. Um, it's not good for us, for our attendees, or for the community. So um, I think um, we we are certainly realistic about what um, what we could handle there um, on an event basis. Uh, but we would be willing to work with the board on um, on determining what you know is a comfortable maximum for a, a community event. You know, other than we're not talking about our um, you know our activities in the ordinary course. We're right. talking about special events. Um, we would certainly be willing to work with the board um, or the board's consultants to determine what that comfortable maximum is right and I and I apologize I thought that was the question I was asking because I think we asked last time is what is what is that reasonable cap because to write a resolution that says we'll have small limited numbers is hard and I know no one wants to have something happen but we don't want it to have an oversized event and then there is an issue and, and then and then we're trying to come back. So I think we're trying, to, at least I am, so the board knows, is that number, is it 300? Is it 200? Is it 100? Is it 50? Uh, no one seems to be able to answer that. So Here, I think. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, so I just think we need to be able to get some, some number on that. Uh, the the uh, we have 64 seats in the worship center, so um, conceivably that would be the number. But we're, we're going to put our planner back on, and while he's testifying, we can uh, fine tune any additional numbers for you. Okay. But it would make sense if we only have 64 seats in the worship center that that number is somewhere in that vicinity, so to speak. All right, great. Okay. Um, and then I guess the only other question, Mr. Mosley, was you had talked about sort of the peak parking demand being based on the analysis that you had submitted in January, the January 19th traffic study. Yeah. And you had said with this increase in parking that subtracting out nine employees from the 36 spaces that you're currently proposing that leaves you 27 left for the food pantry use so you could actually accommodate about an 80 percent increase in the utilization yes of that compared to what we had observed at the Mount Holly facility in uh, in January so one of the other things that we had sort of asked at the last hearing was what are those triggers and those mechanisms <coughs> for adding additional hours or days. My biggest concern is, and I think the testimony at the last meeting was, the food pantry now, and presumably when you were out there doing your analysis in January, is doing about one third of what they did pre-COVID in a much smaller facility. So I, I think what I want the board to at least understand is, if we go back to the pre-COVID numbers and our utilization triples, is there a second day, is there a third day, is there a fourth, how, how do we handle that? And the, the board has been having to guess how to accommodate that. I think we're trying to get the applicant to say, these are the triggers, Th this is how everything will be accommodated. And I, I don't think we're quite, I don't think we're there. So I'll try and answer your, your questions or your comments. Um, we did talk about this within the project team, you know, after the last meeting. So just for comparison purposes, um, the existing facility in Mount Holly oper actually operates out of two buildings. They use some space in an adjacent building. They also have some um, storage units in the rear of the property that they use for the operations of the food pantry. So when you include the square footage of the, the storage units as well as the adjacent um, building, which has some storage in it as well, the overall square footage is comparable to the, the food pantry operations that they have proposed for this location here in Haynesport. So it's not an exact duplicate, but it's very similar in square footage wise. So I think they're similar in that respect. Um, however, your question about you know the pre-COVID numbers versus when we did our counts in January of 2023. 
So we talk to the applicant um, about what their numbers of, they call them bags that they distribute during the food pantry days in January of 2020 versus January of 2023. And when we looked at the numbers and compared the two, there was, there was a reduction, um, I don't want to say reduction, the 2023 numbers are approximately 70% less than the 2020 numbers. So the 2020 numbers obviously are higher than 2023. Um, even as I stated, even if the um, operations go back to the 2020, 2020 levels, that's a 70% increase compared to what we observed as far as peak parking demands. And I believe that this site with 36 spaces can still accommodate those peak parking demands if they were to be kind of linear compared to what we saw in Mount Holly in January of 2023. If it goes beyond that and there's still concerns about parking, obviously the applicant's more than willing to you know, discuss uh, options as far as doing multiple days, extending the hours, doing something as far as you know, st staggering people so they don't all come at the same time, whatever it may be, um, the applicant's willing to work with that. Uh, I don't see why, I don't think, I don't see there being an issue given the operations we anticipate, but if it does occur, uh, I think you know, having a second day for pickup times would be the most reasonable option and that would be able to be easily accommodated with this site. Does that answer your, your question, Scott? Um, <clears throat> Are you looking for like a specific? I, I was partially, and yeah. last time you guys said the same thing, we're happy to have that discussion with the board and I think what we're trying to say is, what are your own triggers? How do you guys manage that? How do we, because one, one really bad Friday and right. somebody's tail end is stuck out in Route 38 is, is too late. So how do, we, how do we do everything we can? How can the board do everything they can? And I know Pastor doesn't want that either. How do we make the parking and the operational part of the park? And I don't think, at least I don't, I really don't have any concern with the place of worship and the adequacy of the parking for that. Right. And also the peak, it, it's a much different sort of operation because it's all in, it's all out at one time. Right. But from the food pantry standpoint, that to me is where the greatest public safety risk comes in that if there is a really bad peak and something hasn't been managed or accommodated properly, we do have an issue. So that, that to me is, I don't want us to all stand here and try to design and guess this on the fly. I don't think that's fair to the board. So we're trying to figure out what is what is your plan if you do because based on you can accommodate an 80 percent increase but you're already at a 70 percent decrease so a 10 percent delta you're already over yeah I, i'm sorry i was listening scott so uh, i think you know from a from a traffic engineering perspective we always we always try and design to sometimes what we call the 85th percentile i'm sure you're familiar with that term what that means basically is the average time is the 50th percentile the 85th percentile is kind of your worst case analysis it's not the worst of the worst but it's it's way up there as far as either traffic or parking demands are concerned so i would say you know that if we got to a point where we observed that we were using about 80 or 85 percent of our parking um, supply for the food pantry operations which would i'm not going to do the math off the top of my head but when we hit that level then you know i think considerations would be given by the applicant to considering that second day of operation and so that will give us that kind of a numerical point um, where we could you know start to consider some other type of um, way to handle the food pantry needs going to a second day or whatever it may be. And I think that would be reasonable to the applicant. Um, but that's kind of, you know, a good engineering threshold, I think. Well, could you condition the, uh, the approval on a formula that would automatically double the number of days, assuming one day presently? You'd make it two days if in the month before um, your formula was triggered. In other words, you had more than uh, X number of visitors and you could see it was going further north. So that triggers, instead of Wednesday being the day, it's now Wednesday and Thursday, something like that. So that it's in the arrangement spelled out uh, an automatic trigger so we don't have to worry about this well what are you going to do yeah. 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 
we, we can agree to that. I mean, I think we need to tweak what that trigger is, you know, but that makes sense. That there's a condition, um, if you're, Got it. the condition of, of any approval would be a trigger at which point there would be, a, that was an additional day would be added to take the pressure off. And then potentially a third day if, if five, 15, whatever point in the future so that we so that we don't have this you know and that's not uncommon especially with places of worship church grows you have to add a second service on Sunday morning so that that is pretty standard but I, I think it's important for there to be some safety mechanism in place to avoid avoid that issue I think that we can look at that. yeah I mean once you establish what the formula is you can repeat it <laughs> so I guess what Mr. Mosley is saying is if he uses 80% as that standard as soon as they as soon as they sort of recognize and hit that point they will then have to add a second a second day and I guess what he's saying is there's a margin of safety in there with that 20% that even if the next month most people show up on Friday or whatever that issue is, I guess you're saying there's some factor of safety. Yeah, there's here. still some additional parking that would be available even beyond that 80% in case you were to get a higher debt. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing to, to say you could reverse it if, if, if it tails off. If, if you find out that you're having months or seasons where we're back to the lower number. That makes sense. Um, Councillor, how many more witnesses do you need? To, uh, the reason I'm asking is I want to take a break for the benefit of everybody around here. Okay, restroom, so forth and so on. I'm going to take a 10 minute break, but what? We're going to come back and put our planning consultant back on for a few minutes. Okay. Uh, and then I may have a couple of questions for the applicant, uh, the pastor herself, but then we'll wrap, then we'll wrap up. Okay, good. Okay. All right, let's, whatever your watch says, 10 minutes from now, we'll be starting, okay? It says 8.20 up here on the clock in front, so 8.30. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, she made me sit down. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I would hear it. Yeah, that's better, really. Yeah. Well, they, that makes it easy. Council, do you have a question? Or you not Can we wait one moment, please? Ugly split level home. Right. We're missing a board member stuff. Board member. Mark, I don't have that problem you're doing. Total control. We have, we have some board. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, by the way, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Waiting for one board member, I think. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there was a line. <laughs> We're back. Um, our next witness, uh, we're recalling our planning consultant, Mark Renza. Okay, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members, and members of the public. Um, my name is Mark Remsa. I'm a professional planner in the state of New Jersey. Um, I'm going to be as brief uh, a as possible. My um, uh, discussion is going to start with uh, Mr. Taylor's uh, review letter um, and I'm going to uh, uh, speak to a couple items for the clarity of the, of the record. So um, in terms of uh, section A in his report cite 
proposal uh, and surrounding area. Um, but paragraph number four starts off with um, uh, the applicant proposes to use the site as a food pantry and a place of worship with fellowship hall, clothing distribution, life skill classes, and code blue temporary housing. Just want to be clear, the principal use here is a place of worship. That's the principal use. And there are ancillary social services proposed. Okay. Life skill classes, food pantry, clothing distribution, and seasonal warming center. Th th those are the ancillary uses for, for this use uh, and from the site. Uh, 4C, uh, just to be clear, uh, from earlier testimony, um, the fellowship hall, which is, is where the house of worship is going to take place, um, the days and hours of operation are Sunday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., and Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. to 8.30 uh, p.m. Then in section C, I'm going to avoid being re repetitive, but uh, section C1, again, the um, uh, proposed use is the place of worship with those ancillary social s services uh, that I described to you. Now, um, section D talks about, uh, 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 D1 talks about the proofs that have to be provided um, for the uh, uh, proposed use. And this proposed use is an inherently beneficial use. Um, uh, there's case law that uh, uh, indicates that places of worship are inherently beneficial uses. And also um, uh, community shelters are also inherently beneficial uses. And because this is an inherently beneficial use, the test that we have to use, to be clear, is called the SICA test. And that's oh, say that again? S-I-C-A, SICA okay. test. All right. And the SICA test um, requires uh, several proofs uh, that are part of uh, that test. So what are they? One, we have to identify what the public interest at stake is. Number two, we have to determine if there's any detrimental effects uh, uh, that would in, uh, ensue from the granting of the uh, uh, use variance. Three, can any of these detrimental effects be reduced by imposing reasonable conditions? And four, you have to weigh the positive and negative criteria, which essentially is you're weighing the public interest in that inherently beneficial use against any uh, public detriment. Okay, can we just clarify so I understand exactly what you're talking about? I think I do. You're talking about a place of worship that is not permitted in a highway commercial area. That's the use variance that you are requesting, and you just enumerated the reasons why. I, I, I First part, you're absolutely correct. That's why we're here. The second part was I, I identified the steps that we have to take under the SICA test. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is just go through those points of the SICA test for, for the board. What was the fourth one again? Uh, balance, uh, you, you weigh the uh, public interest against any public detriment. It's, it's the weighing of the positive and negative criteria. So um, the public interest at stake here is a house of worship with those uh, ancillary social services. And those, um, uh, uh, because it, then it's an inherently beneficial use, it automatically satisfies the advancement or the promotion of the, the purposes of the municipal land use law. That's, that's what the case law says uh, uh, under the SICA case. Um, and, and that was SICA versus um, a wall township. And, and, I'm, and I'm certainly sure Mr. Kingsbury will uh, uh, agree with these are the steps, the legal steps that we have to satisfy uh, for, for this board. So since we've identified the uh, public uh, purpose at stake, so number two, we have to talk about what detrimental effects 
may ensue from granting this use variance. <coughs> so when I look at this, um, a lot of the uh, potential detrimental effects revolve around a number of the, the, the bulk variances that are associated with this property. <coughs> Essentially the, the setbacks uh, from the parking. Um, and uh, they're all related to, and I'm not going to go through them all because uh, Mr. Malinowski did a very good job identifying each one painstakingly. But they're all related to the shape of this lot, the size of this lot, and the fixed improvements that are on this lot, the buildings that are there. Because where they're located, closer to the, to the eastern part of the property, and to accommodate the uh, uh, 36 parking spaces and to satisfy the industry standards for the design of those parking spaces and to accommodate the uh, trash enclosure and the other uh, items uh, that are necessary to have the property function properly. We have resulting uh, deficient setbacks, the buffers and things of that nature around the edges. We also, um, your, your parking requirements in your ordinance are not related to uh, a variance. They have their, their design standards, so they, they hold a, a lower level of, 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 of proof. But nevertheless, uh, they were important for the discussion of this property. And the uh, 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 parking proposed, I believe now, I think we're talking about having sufficient parking and, and I'm going to get to another part that's going to talk about the con, uh, conditions, those reasonable conditions, because that's, that's the, the third part of the test. So essentially, you have this piece of property, certain size, certain shape, certain uh, e existing fixed features on, on the property. As a matter of fact, we're actually removing um, uh, the uh, residential part of this property, building number one. And by doing so, we actually gain back space and improve and enhance uh, at least the buffer along the uh, western property line and, and really reducing uh, the uh, intrusion into the wetland buffer. So given that, uh, uh, defining that as the, the detriment, what kind of reasonable conditions can be placed on um, uh, this application to uh, mitigate any of these detrimental effects. And we started to talk about that with the last, last um, uh, 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 witness. And I'll start off with the, uh, the, the parking. So it's my opinion that a reasonable condition would be placed on that when the parking demand reaches 80% of the parking capacity, that's 29 spaces. So when the applicant is operating, starting to see 29, and, and it's now happening repetitively, we have to go to a second day. And that second day, what we have to do is we have to divide up the users of the food pantry evenly, because we, we want to, how do you do that? Well, you look, you look at the folks uh, uh, by uh, alphabetically last name, so that we can say from A to L or A to M, We've got roughly 50% of our custom, our clientele come uh, on, on a day and then the other. So you can evenly divide and then get it back down to, to a lower level of parking demand. And I think it was said before that even dividing the two, if we start to reach 80%, uh, we have to go to a third day. And then you re rework it so that the alphabetically that they're almost evenly proportioned to come uh, uh, for the food pantry. Another reasonable condition, and I think it, I have to thank Mr. Taylor for mentioning this because he said, what about special events or wedding? Well, you have, thir you have um, a si uh, uh, 60, uh, 36 parking spaces. And, and, and in your uh, ordinance, you can provide one parking space for three um, seats. So if we had uh, uh, that rule, that equates to roughly 108 people. 
What I'm saying is a reasonable condition is to set it at 100, and that's for all people of the site. So that way you'll, you'll have sufficient parking based on your, your, your standards and that we wouldn't exceed uh, the parking demand. That way we're able to uh, have a reasonable condition and have no more than, than uh, uh, 100 people at any one time uh, for, for an event. And then I say the uh, 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 last reasonable condition is to um, require the level of landscaping, and, and uh, uh, that's in Mr. Taylor's report, to be placed around the property um, and, and the uh, aesthetics of, of the fencing. Because I, I believe uh, Ms. Tyndall asked the question, well, what's around the property? Well, to the back are woods, and another parking lot. So a parking lot next to a parking lot in woods wouldn't have such a detrimental effect. However, to be considerate to have a proper aesthetic, you put an aesthetic fence up. And then to the east, we have um, a Legacy, which is another uh, social service provider. And it was roughly 27 feet of open grass. So if we put another aesthetic fence with landscaping, and then of course around the front, um, to put the landscaping as prescribed in Mr. Taylor's report. And then to the west, we have hundreds and hundreds of, of thick woods, uh, actually beautiful uh, 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 string corridor and he heavily vegetated uh, uh, area. So there's really no detriment at all to, to the west uh, uh, from, from the uh, uh, proposal. So those are the reasonable conditions that would uh, uh, allow for uh, this uh, particular use to be um, uh, approved on this piece of property. So now we've got the um, uh, weighing of the two, the public interest and the public detriment, which I believe is not so great. So the public interest is the house of worship with those social services, which are very much needed uh, by the public uh, said, so, said so by uh, uh, case law. And then we have these reasonable conditions that would mitigate them down to have really not much of a negative impact at all to the uh, uh, parking lot in the back, the woods in the back, the uh, office building uh, to, the, uh, to, the e uh, to the east. And there's no detriment at all. It's just beautiful woods. Uh, and, and then we've got wetlands that we really have to, uh, and wetland buffer. So Mr. Chairman and board members, with uh, uh, giving the SICA test proofs that I just gave you, it's my opinion uh, that you can grant this use variance and the other bulk variances <coughs> and the design exceptions that were associated with this if we adhere to those reasonable conditions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can you could you use the microphone so people back can hear? Thank you. Sure. Um, just want Mr. Uh, Remsa to confirm that the SICA test that he refers to was uh, set out by the uh, New Jersey Supreme Court. Correct. That is correct. Okay. So that is the test that the, the highest court in New Jersey has um, provided. Um, uh, that's applicable to this case, the determination being made here. That, that, is, that is the required uh, uh, proofs for all inherently beneficial uses in the state of New Jersey. Okay. And, Thank and you. as a planner, I, I have to provide uh, the uh, uh, planning proofs uh, uh, for that. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Johnson? Anybody on the board have a question or professionals? No. Nope. I do have a question. Does SICA use the word substantial uh, in the weighing of public interest versus public detriment? In other words, um, public interest has to be substantially outweighed by public detriment or substantial not in the test? No, it's not in the test. Okay. Thank you. 
No other questions for Mr. Benson? Nope. Okay. I just have one follow-up question um, for the applicants. Um, so if I could, and that, Jeremy, can I, you can stand and stay right there if you like, but just stand if you would. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm so, I'm so used to being loud enough to... Um, what's that? Yes. Um, so my uh, my single follow up question for um, for the pastor is, um, Pastor Trappier, um, do I understand correctly that the County of Burlington has awarded the Be a Beacon of Hope a four hundred thousand dollar grant for this project? Yes. Okay. So in fact, you've already been awarded grant funds by the County of Burlington for this project. That is correct. Okay. That's all I have. While you're up there, um, uh, Pastor Trappier, may I just ask you a couple of questions? Not new stuff. This is uh, just for the benefit of the folks in the audience that weren't here before. You're, you presently have one location in Mount Holly. Correct. Correct. And that location will be closed when you move to your new location. Correct. Okay. Um, how do you service Delaware and Pennsylvania and New Jersey from Mount, Ho Mount Holly location? Because I read this in the newspaper, and before you answer the question, I want to compliment you on the Woman of the Year award. It's very admirable. Um, but that's where I saw this, and I was like, whoa, we're not going to Pennsylvania and Delaware from Hainesport. What, so what is, what is the, the genesis of that? We have people that um, relocate from Delaware, from Pennsylvania, and from different parts of New Jersey. Meaning relocate, meaning they move to this area? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you were servicing those areas. No, they reloc when they relocate here, we service them, yes. Okay, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, any questions from the board members or our professionals? Well, uh, Pastor, I'm sorry, I let you sit down, I should have called you. Can you just give, give us a little more information about the, the nature of the, of the 400K grant from the county? In other words, well, what's, it, what's it called, first of all, and, and what are the purposes of, uh, and uses for the grant money? You know, is this, is this county money, state money, federal money? Help us understand. It is HUD funding for federal the purchase money. of so it's federal money dispersed through the county yes okay and I mean, what's the what's the grant called I mean, the labels help sometimes community development block grant cb3 okay and what is the statutory purpose of the grants to purchase um property it depends on what you're applying for and i applied for it to purchase property okay so this this is a grant that will assist in the in the build out development of this particular parcel. Correct. And is any of the is any of the grant money also used for ongoing operating expenses, maintenance, that sort of thing? No. So it's all to be used for developmental purposes. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I I have a question. Was that through COVID fund? Was that COVID, CV means COVID COVID funding third tranche maybe? Um, no, community development. You okay. can deal with that, yeah. It wasn't COVID? It no, wasn't no. COVID pass-through funding? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm so used to being plenty loud enough. Um, um, we've put on our last witness, um, but we will uh, obviously gladly answer any additional questions that anyone has. Um, I would ask that I be permitted to uh, make closing comments after the public has its opportunity to provide its comments. Yes. Granted.
straight. Now, we're, we're at a point, yes. So I have one quick question as the enforcement end of every approval, denial, whatever the case may be. So if the board were to choose to approve this, and we talked about additional days for the food pantry, then is that outlined in that resolution as to myself or a future zoning official that how it's described of hours of operation, meaning that if on Friday she knew that it was going to be overkill and the next group would be coming on Monday, let's say A through L, as Mr. Remsa has stated. If that's the case for an enforcement issue, is that outlined in our resolution, I mean, clearly defined as those uh, those additional days as well as hours? Because what again, as I always say, is that when this is all said and done, the zoning official in any town has to enforce the rules. Mm -hmm. So with that said, a, having something outlined specifically in the resolution uh, makes our jobs much easier. So that's what, if if that's the case, is that as I would request that those items are clearly outlined in the resolution for myself or any future uh, enforcement agent. Okay, it's duly noted, and I think Thank Mr. You. Kingsbury has noted it. He's talking to me. Um, <laughs> Most days I do. Well, yes, of course. You have okay. read my resolution, and uh, that will be in there. <coughs> yes, Mr. Kingsbury does a phenomenal resolution for me. Yes. So it has held up in many cases. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And answer to your question is yes, you may have a closing argument. Thank okay. you. Not argument, closing so, statement. Very good. Thank you. Okay. And actually, Ms. Edwards, while you're there, maybe just to kind of put that to bed because based on the parking analysis and when some of their other activities are going on, um, if you add additional days during the week, it can't be you have other events on Wednesday, Monday and Wednesday during that same period. So I think yeah, it's Wednesday night. Life skills. So you don't have life life skill life skills classes 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. So the life skills classes are, do not aren't occurring on property. The, the answer to your question, Mr. Taylor, was no. The shake of the head was no. So all right, so then there because what we don't want to do is add a second food pantry day on a day when there's already some other activity going on on site. Um, and I think that that should probably get fleshed out in the resol in any resolution if there if there is we're fortunate enough to get an approval. I think we need to uh, we need to flesh certain of these issues out in the resolution. That was all I have, Mr. Chairman. The other, issue, the other, the other, other formula you have to put in, or maybe this is really a formula, but the number at least is the special events count. Right. We 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 have talked about that. Um, we believe that the um, that the number is. We were initially when we were bantering back and forth here when we spoke about it on the record earlier tonight. We said. 64 because there are 64 seats in the house of worship um, but what makes sense um, we believe subject to the board's agreement if we're fortunate enough to get an approval would be a hundred um, that would be um, consistent with your parking standard for a house of worship correct correct would include everyone, 100 people total. 100 people total. Um, we have 36 parking spaces, and it's three per. Three per, which is 108. 
three per, which is 108, but it, we would round down to 100. And 100 is close. Technically, our ordinance, and I'm sorry to interrupt, technically, nope. our, our ordinance is one space per three seats plus one per pastor plus one per two other employees. So it's not just a straight gross at 1.3. So I, I think 100 puts us close unless there are three pastors and four employees and then and then we're a little bit and then we're a little bit shy on that so i just want the board and, and everybody to be clear it is one per three plus one per pastor plus one per two other employees so scott if you do the math and we said 100 total that would include the pastor and and the two employees so actually there's even less than 100 um uh uh, visitors coming to the site right that's why we're saying max out a hundred people total inclusive of our staff. inclusive of staff and 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 uh, uh, the, the pastor uh, let, me, let me push you on that a little bit um, if you do a special event it's going to be in the house of worship section front section I mean you're not going to use the second floor because that's storage correct you're not going to use the back building first floor because that's well, at least in cold weather, that's that's so sleeping. Right. So you're going to use the house of worship. So, so when you got the fire department approval, did they give you? Because um, they will eventually give you a maximum occupancy number for that house of worship. Yeah. Uh, have they? Uh, I don't. No longer have. post the You can post it at 100. Well, but the fire department's got it. They have, they have formulas to figure out maximum occupancy. I don't know what they have. Kent, you want to speak to this? Because I think you were going there earlier. Yeah, I'm, we would figure the occupancy based on egress uh, components and um, look at the area of the, the building. Um, you, would t you could either figure the occupancy by dividing, the, um, by dividing a square foot figure by the total square foot so number of square feet per occupant. I think for assembly use, tables and chairs, it's 15 square feet per occupant. Um, but in this, in the case of uh, any building where you're determining the occupancy of the building, the, the owner has the right to post the occupancy if it's less than the maximum occupancy. So if we agree that the maximum occupancy is 100, put us on on the wall, it's just maximum occupancy is 100. And you get that approved by the fire official, yes. If the fire, if the fire official approves it. Yes, if the fire official says it's something other than that. I mean, the fire of course, he would say 50, you know, and, the, and he's not going to abide by 100. If he says 90, he might abide by 100. Ultimately, we'll need to abide yes. by what he says. Yes. Yeah, we understand. I'm just saying that nobody's gotten that number. No. Not yet. That could be a condition of the resolution. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, the condition would be that the, that, that the special event cap would be subject to fire department approval, like everything else. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay, we've come to that point in time. Believe it or not, I don't want you to all have heart attacks. We're going to read public comment, okay? <laughs> That's you folks in the back. It's your turn. Uh, just a couple of things. It's called public comment, not public debate, not question and answer, not argument. It's public comment from you and the public to us on the board. And I'm going to ask, please, do not come up to the podium and start to talk and then turn and badger the, the applicant or the attorney or any of their professionals. It's not the purpose of it. It's for you to come up to the podium, address the board. If you have a problem with that, then specifically address it to me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to allow people to talk. Um, it's going to be, you're going to be five minutes. Each person will be able to talk for five minutes, and I'll thank you for your comments, and we'll move on to the next one. And I want to do it in an orderly fashion. I don't want to go willy-nilly and have people yelling and screaming and raising hands. Question, Mrs. Costco, do we have people online? Yes. How many do you have, do you know? 
seven. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna I'm gonna do a trial run in house first. So I'm going to go from left side to right side. Anybody over on this side would like to speak, please raise your hand, come up to the podium. Mr. Kingsbury will swear you in. You have to clearly state your name and address, and then we'll hear your comment. Yes, ma'am. I didn't ask this guy to go first, but. <laughs> Somebody had to start. Somebody has to start. I have to swear you in first. Yep. My name is Janice Ludden. I live in. Okay. One minute. You swear or affirm the testimony you give tonight will be the truth, or truth, nothing but true stuff you got. So help me. Name, out. please. I do. Janice Ludden. Janice. J A N I C E Ludden. L U D D E N. L U D D E N. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I have a bunch of notes that I kept modifying tonight as things change, but um, I don't know if it's the best place for this church, but um, from what I've been hearing, the things that they're proposing to do are exactly what any church should be doing. Um, you know, a house of worship is meant to reach out to the community, to serve the needs of those around them. Um, uh, the pastor has a lot of experience, so it's not like she's just envisioning a new something that she's bringing to the community. She's been doing this for 10, 11 years. She's won a very prestigious honor recently. And um, so I think, you know, that bodes well for she's bringing something and she's already been doing it. So it's not like she's inventing it. Um, the variances as far as, um, you know, the boundaries and all those seem very reasonable in my opinion. Um, the parking has been bantered around um, a lot. I know there's concern about if it backs up on 38, and I and I understand that. I'm wondering, like we have wall wall right on the corner. People are pulling into the wall wall while people are backing out, and so sometimes people are a little bit delayed. People are coming around the corner. People are coming through the light. I don't know how many accidents, how many people have been rear-ended at wall but this is further down. So I'm thinking that it may not be as much of a problem as long as they keep it under control and make sure that um, they're keeping an eye on it. And it sounds like to me, they also know who's coming. They have lists or something that, you know, they're talking about A through L or whatever. Um, and they're talking about peak times, but it seems to me that they can even distribute who comes more evenly throughout the day that they're doing it rather than having you know a peak time at nine or whatever, but it seems like there's some flexibility there. All right, my concerns are just Could, in- May I just interrupt you for one second? Sure. So the Wawa is closing. Oh. Yes, but it's been okay. there. And yeah. I'm just using that as an example of things oh. that, there's already that kind of confusion and traffic okay. on that corner, which is even worse in my opinion okay. to what they're proposing. Because while, while you were saying that, I saw some faces in the back going, what's she talking about? They're closing. I just wanted to let you know. No, I'm just comparing current okay. traffic to gotcha. what we've lived with for ever since I can remember. Um, the only thing that I have some concern with is they're paving a lot of area uh, with impervious surface. And, um, you know, the way with climate warming and changing and more heavy rainfalls and all and the pollution in our waters that come a lot from the runoff that I would like to see at least the parking areas not the, the part that you drive on um, maybe be like grass pavers or something that would allow the water to penetrate into the ground and that there'd be a lot more filtration of the water before it actually goes into the sewer system and into our water system so um, well, I think that's all of my notes. But thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, yes, gentleman in the third row here. So can I have your name first, please? My name is John Schroeder. Say that again. Schroeder. S C H R O E D E R. S C H R O E D E R. You can, you can, is J, J -O -N, John. you can raise that microphone. Sir, do you uh, swear or affirm the testimony you give tonight will be the truth, whole truth, other than truth, stuff you got? I do. Um, I may have one concern. And in a word, it's safety. 
Uh, we've heard a lot of testimony tonight, and we in fact had testimony a couple months ago. And uh, regardless of what measures or procedures are taken to mitigate or to minimize the traffic coming into the Beacon of Hope, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that we're going to see an increase in demand as time goes by. That with regard to the fact that this location is adjacent to a very dangerous intersection, I think it's not the ideal. In fact, I think it would be a dangerous location for the place. So that's why I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comments. All the way in back. Not the other back. <laughs> First, please. Catherine McNellis, 407 Bischoff Avenue. You swear or affirm the testimony you give tonight will be the truth or the truth must be the truth of God. I do. Thank you. You have to excuse me if I repeat something because I don't hear everything because of my hearing aids, but I did hear something about Wawa and it closed in. You can't count that. You can't worry about today. You've got to worry about what's going to come in the future. Something else will be there someday. So it doesn't matter that it's closed. Yep. But I understand, a little out of breath, that they want to have buses come, people get off the bus at Wawa and walk down to this place. And my question is, now they're there, picking up groceries, clothes, whatever, how do they get back to Mount Holly? How do they get back across the highway to a bus stop over there to go back? So I think it's something you should consider. I think it's very dangerous to have it there because I go down there 28 years I went to Philadelphia. The cars come up on your side flying. And they don't want to not be in front. So they just keep going. And if this person keeps going, they go right past where it says no more. They're almost to the seniors sometimes by the time they get in. It's just a dangerous place there. Besides the fact I've been fighting for commercial property for 30 years. It's a commercial property. It should be commercial business. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. What on the line? Yeah. Name, please. Nancy Beck. All right. Uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth, whole truth, nothing but truth, stuff you got? I do. Thank you. I just wanted to elaborate on what Mr. Schroeder said about safety, and I wondered if the board had considered what occurs when there is an accident there, and the street is closed, and the residents of the Glen cannot get into their development because they have one way in and one way out. I think that's important for the board to consider. <coughs> And also the $13,000 in taxes that we will be losing, how the board will absorb that, and will that be made known to the residents of Haynesport? Uh, they're my two concerns. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. There was a hand over here. Just one second. I'll get, get you next. Somebody had their hand over here, too. Okay, come on up. <laughs> next, we're going to go to online, okay? Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I? Okay, we'll get you. Name, please. Kent Pipes, 35 Mount Laurel Road, Haynes Park. <coughs> you are affirm the testimony you give will be the truth, or truth, something the truth, something the other. I do, thank you. 
I've rehearsed a number of times what I'm going to say. Probably won't come out after I say it when I go back and sit in my seat and think about what I said. But you have professionals that sit at this table who advise you on the technicalities of the application. Unless either one of them said it is not the thing you should approve, get past it. You've already dealt with the, the variances, the conditions, and all the rest. What Mr. Remsa said is more important. Federal law says the church has a right to express its faith in the way it chooses, because that's the fundamental nature of the way our country was formed. Congressman, or Senator Hatch, a conservative Republican, and Senator Kennedy, a liberal Democrat, got together and said churches are being discriminated against all across this country, and they passed in Congress what's called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Pur 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 um, Purpose Act, which says the churches almost have an absolute right to live out their faith. St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church versus Hoboken in New Jersey said churches have a right to house the poor, feed them, and clothe them as a fundamental right from the Judeo-Christian tradition thousands of years back. It's not just a new thing in New Jersey. If you dare vote against this application and it has to go to court, you're going to lose. And you waste a lot of taxpayers' money in fighting the case because it is clear the law is on their side. And when you vote, the requirements are that each one of you has to state the reason why you vote yes or no. You can't just say no and then let it go. You have to say why. That's not correct. I don't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> you can interrupt me. That's okay. That's not correct. They don't have to state their reasons. It's been told before. The reasons have to be stated in the resolution. Okay. And then they vote on the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Kingsbury. He's a he's one of my mentors, <laughs> right? Pardon? You taught me a lot about law, but that's one you missed. Okay. <laughs> well, that's true. But I just want you to know that that Haynesport needs to be a place that poor people feel welcome. <clears throat> the poor people can get the services that they need because we're a loving, caring community. I live right up the street. I paid taxes here for 24 years. And I have just as much a right to demand from you that we have a place for people who are in need and not just send them someplace else. Courts are very clear. You can't deny people who are poor a place in your community. That's Mount Laurel, extended beyond just housing into inclusiveness. We're a stronger community when people feel they're welcome and have a place that gives them dignity and provides services that they need, whether it's people who are disabled whether it's folks that don't, are, don't have income or are seniors, we have to provide for everybody. And so I would encourage you, get past some of the ugliness that can come out in a hearing like this and do the right thing for the right reason. Friday's Good Friday. For most of us who are Christians, we're gonna celebrate the fact that Jesus did the thing he needed to do. And I just encourage you tonight to do the thing you need to do. Thank you, sir. Uh, gentleman against the wall, I'm sorry, I didn't notice your hand before. Sir, your name please? Thomas Kalachi, C-O-L-C-O-L-E-C-E. -E. Do it again. Kalachi, C-O-L-A-C-E. First name? Thomas. Thomas, sir. You share our firm testimony here will be the truth, whole truth, nothing but truth, stuff we got. I do. Okay. I'm sort of glad I got to come in after that. My reason is being that I think that, I mean, that's sort of like a grandstand to me. Um, I'm a good person. I'm a Christian. I'm going to celebrate Good Friday. And if, as far as the Sika Tesco's, these services are here already. We already heard in testimony tonight, we're basically covering the same amount of area. They're just moving it. That's somewhat of a convenience. I wasn't here to judge that. That wasn't going to give me a reason for being here. But that sort of it compelled me to say that that these services are already here. Any court's going to look at that, you're only moving a mile, two miles away. So I don't think that should ruin anyone's decision. I, that's my opinion. 
But my concern is no one talked about, I'm in the food business for 45 years, and no one's talked about the refuge, okay? I mean, how the dumpsters, what kind of food we're talking about, what has to get thrown away. In 45 years of being in the food business, that's a real problem. If you're not doing this properly, that 400 woods buffer becomes a breeding ground for rodents, rats, everything. That was never asked, never addressed. We weren't allowed to bring any questions up. But that's something that really needs to be addressed. And I think, I don't know when you can do it now, if it's to the end, but it's a little late now. I don't know if it's how this works. But like I said, 45 years in the food business, and I have no idea what kind of food, but if anybody wants to come down, I'm exit 20, I run a processing plant. I ran, was in the Philadelphia produce market. I had my own place at Oregon and Swanson, and you should see what dumpsters full of food can be like in the middle of the summertime. And you're talking a serious, serious condition if it's not properly taken care of, and no one's addressed that, and I think it needs to be addressed especially being a neighborhood and you have a lot of people that live in those developments back there and i just think that was never addressed and it needs to be addressed but and then i'm going to just go one more thing on i don't think that this these decisions need to be made as what's practical what's best for all and i'm not here to judge let the good lord judge i mean but these these this stuff is currently being done right now they are, they are only saying nine people in the shelter. I'm sure there's nine people in the shelter now. They're saying that um, they have the church, they have two buildings, the traffic man said that we're basically talking about the same square footage. So no one's gonna judge us on, these are services that we're adding. We're not adding them, we're moving them, we're relocating them. So if it's better to relocate them, so be it. If it's not, so be it. But that's not your good way on this judgment. That's my opinion. Okay, right. thank you for your comments. I said I was going to go get one person online first. Oh. If, there, if they have any comments. Is there anyone online that has any comments at this point? If so, if you can unmute yourself. Mrs. Rivas or Mr. Rivas? Deborah Harris. Oh. Okay. Yes, ma'am. We'll come back to in this building. Name, please. Judy Mealy, M E L I. Say it again. M as Mary, E L I. Nelm. Mealy. Mealy. You swear or affirm the testimony you give tonight will be the truth, all truth, nothing but truth, stuff to God. Yes. Go ahead. Going back to the first or second meetings, uh, they were talking about Fridays being a four hour window for the food or clothing pickup. It was stated that they had contracts with Uber for transportation for people and that the state had free passes for the public service buses. Uh, walking, it's already been discussed down there or trying to cross back over to get to a westbound bus is highly dangerous. The pastor had stated before that they would be bringing food to Mount Holly to the residents that couldn't get here. Um, she also stated in the beginning of the meetings that if they couldn't get there Friday, there was a two hour window Thursday night that they would be able to come, which has now changed, I believe. There was also classes for finances, how to deal with and get out of domestic abuse and all that. All these classes were going to be held there. Now they're saying no. There's plenty of places in the county, if she has 400,000 of county funding, there's empty schools that have rooms, plenty of rooms. They could take in more 
on Code Blues. They could have their classes. There's cafeterias and full kitchens. It's not a taxable building to the county, so it wouldn't do the county any harm giving up one of these schools that could easily be updated to accommodate this. Also, another alternative is what used to be the, I don't know the correct term for it, there's a prison across from the closed down college that they closed down the prison. It's rooms, it's a cafeteria, it's a gymnasium, there's plenty of parking, even at the schools there's plenty of parking, a lot more room than they would ever need. Or for that matter, make use of part of the college. If the, if the county's willing to give them the money, then use county buildings. SNAP is ending, I believe, the end of this month, so there's going to be an increase. So they're saying 70% to 80%. That's not much if all these people are losing their SNAP benefits. And if 500 people landed, of the 500 people that landed in Philly came to New Jersey, then they're going to need a lot more room. But I think they're between closed down schools or the closed down uh, prison across from the college, even a closed down strip mall could easily be converted from breaking through walls and take up the whole strip. Give them plenty of parking. But the schools and the county, they're not losing anything. Where we would be, we would be losing a rateable. And I think a closed down school is a perfect situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. <laughs> hold, hold just one second. You're, you're next after I take care of somebody online, if I get somebody online. Is there anyone online that has a comment? If so, unmute yourself. Again, no. Okay. Yes, sir. The gentleman in the back, come forward, please. By the way, I, I want to compliment everybody who's spoken so far. I haven't even had to get close to a one-minute warning, so thank you all. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Kingsbury, I'll swear you in. Name? Ed Maroney. Ed Maroney. Matt Law Road, Hainsport. You, sir, are from the testimony you give tonight to be the truthful truth. Well, let me do something else. I do. Okay. What I uh, have a problem with is uh, that parking situation. I took a ride there today just to see so that I, I would know what to say at this meeting. But that no way represents the space that's there. You, when I pulled in, I pulled in and it's all grass. But there's not enough room for even 10 parking places, let alone 26 or 36. There's no way. <clears throat> so I had to turn around. I have a, a small SUV, a Ford Escape. They're not a very big car. I had to back up and turn around like this more than one time to get back out of there. It's j there's just no way that that's... A, a genuine representation of the parking situation there. And right now it's just all grass. There is no pavement there. So I, I, I just didn't understand that. But when they look at the, I'm sorry, when they look at the, uh, the, the photo there, that shows the true representation. That drawing does not. If you look at that photo, you'll see that that space, <coughs> Right here. See all the grass? It's, yeah. Okay. This. See this space right here? This is just all grass. Sir, and you're you're show the this board. Is an exaggeration. Sir, show us. We didn't see what you were pointing to. We're, we're the ones that have to vote. Okay, yes. Yeah. Well, you can see, it's so small. That this is a piece of grass here, but the way it's drawn there, it looks like it's like over here, this big. It's not that big. 
it's a, it, you could only get like maybe 10 spaces. Because I had to go, you know, a small escape. I had to turn around like that to get mm -hmm. back out. Okay. There's no room. So, I don't know what they're talking about there, parking. But the, the, it, it doesn't seem to be okay. accurate. I appreciate your comments. And by virtue of what I'm about to say, our professionals will look into it and make sure that what is being presented to us is what's represented on that diagram. Yes, it, it's the picture, not, not that diagram. That's, that's exaggerated. Well, they, they, know what, they know how to do it, OK? Right. Mr. Taylor and Mr. Miller are very good at what they do, so. We'll Thank you. God okay. bless. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Mr. Kingsbury will swear you in. State your name, please. My name is Ingrid Kelly. What's the first name? Ingrid, I-N-G-R-I-D, like Ingrid Berkman. Okay. And Kelly, like Grace Kelly? You can use that. <laughs> the testimony you give will be the truth, all truth, nothing but truth, stuff you got. 100%. Okay. Thank you. Um, I am one of the owners of the property, 1285 Route 38. Okay, so stay this way. 1230, 1285 Route 38. I'm one of the owners. Uh, it was a reason, re, uh, previously my father's business, Aaron Levin Art Galleries. He passed away in 2017. And myself and my sister and my niece and nephew are the current owners of the estate. Okay. My reason for coming up here, because it's very difficult to sit and listen when people are talking about things that I know to be fact or not fact. Prime example, and I'm just going to address the parking issue. The area that the gentleman just spoke of previously, it's grass because it was once a gravel parking lot. And since the business has been shut down, it's grown over and become grass. So what they are actually working on is what the existing parameter of the parking lot was. And by the way, it is private property, so no one should be going on without my permission. Okay. Next. I would like to address the fact that my father had the business for 35 years and there has been constant foot traffic in front of that gallery and even when I ran it after he passed for three years, especially when they opened up the Legacy Treatment Center next door, people were walking constantly in front of us, coming from the bus stop constantly, walking on our property. And in fact, I believe, and I don't know who on the board was here when my father came requesting a sidewalk at one time and was told that that was not the responsibility of necessarily Haynesport Township, but of the Department of Transportation. Because he was tired of people walking in his parking lot, especially before and after his normal um, signed business hours. And then the other issue with the traffic, the traffic has existed there and gotten worse the entire 35 years he was there. And when the Department of Transportation put in the <coughs> third lane that runs in front of our business, <coughs> that certainly helped it out a lot because my father did a lot of business. He owned an art gallery. We hosted art auctions. And we fit 30 to 40 cars when he would get his permit for his auctions, whatever he needed. It was rare, but when he had them, it happened. And we fit many, many cars. And the traffic existed. And all the people that came to buy art day after day, week after week, we never had a problem. I'm not saying I know that there's been no accidents on 38. I'm sure there is. But where we are and how far down we are from the intersection of Haynesport, Mount Lowell. Excuse me, please, folks. The, we have one meeting going on here. It's this way. The intersection of Haynesport, Mount Lowell Road and Route 38, it's pretty far down to the left from us. Again, I'm not going to say I've never seen people speed, but with that third turning lane into our lot, it certainly helped. We never had rear end collisions. We never had problems, at least that I am aware of or that my dad is aware of, but I'm not going to say there's never been an accident. So this existed. <coughs> there is a business that lived there for 35 years. And now someone else wants to come in. Yes, I'm one of the owners. But it's not like it's an issue that all of a sudden foot traffic is going to be worse or the traffic on 38 is going to be worse because we had an existing business. And that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you for your comments. 
Um, did anybody wake up online yet? No. All right. I'm not asking again. Uh, anybody, put your hand up if you want to speak. Yes, ma'am. Come forward, please. <clears throat> Mr. Kingsbury will swear you in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Audrey Winsinger. Audrey? Yes. Last name? Winsinger. W I N Z I N G E R. You swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth, whole truth, nothing but truth, nothing else. I do. Thank you. Um, I live in Haynesport, but we have a fair amount of properties that are in Mount Holly that are um, neighbors to Beacon of Hope and uh, are, as a neighbor, Darlene and her team are very good neighbors to us. Um, Darlene's a partner. She's stepped up, and um, she's been a very, very active member of our Main Street Mount Holly, and she and I have done a lot of community projects together. Um, and so I know her, I know her operation well. I see it very close up. And I've seen it for a very long time. And as I say, she is um, definitely um, a neighbor that we're all very proud of. Uh, but the main thing that I think that always amazes all of us is that if she can operate her current business out of the postage stamp that she operates out of today with on-street parking for the, all the cars that come and people that come and be a good neighbor while doing it. It certainly proves to all of us that she is smart and resourceful and a good manager. So they sit up here and listen to all the things and all the questions about how you're going to park and how you're going to get out and how you're going to get in. I know one thing, she'll figure it out. She's figured it all out. She figures everything out that we always watch go on there and um, she's worked with us and we've been able to work with her and I can't say enough good things about her operation and, and um, what she does for the people that she helps and for the people that are around her. Okay, thank you for your comments. Anybody else? Put your hand up. Come forward, please, ma'am. <clears throat> name, please. Hello. Victoria Boyer, B O Y E R. The last name again? Boyer, B O Y E R. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you give? will be the truth, well, truth, not the truth, stuff to God. I do. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, I live at the Glen, um, and um, I've been there for 19 years. And I am opposed to um, the beacon of hope uh, moving into this area. Um, I was told that Route 38 is not zoned for a church. Another cons my concern is that if this is approved, it sets a precedence for all the other townships that border Route 38. Now, living in the Glen is a 55 and older community. We have a lot of residents that are over 70, 80, 90 years old who live alone. Some of them are d disabled. And having a homeless shelter next to a 55 and older community does not make sense to me. If they are, um, if some of the um, homeless people are brought in um, due to a code blue, and I suppose they decide they don't want to be there for whatever reason, they are going to leave and wander. The first place they will come across is the Glen, which puts our residents at risk. Now, some homeless people do suffer from mental illness. Some have drug and alcohol addiction. 
and it's risky. I don't think this is a proper place for um, the facility of the Beacon, um, Beacon of Hope. Um, Mount Holly seems to have all of the things that they need. They have a, a, a full-time police department, a full-time um, fire department, plenty of parking, which Haynes Board does not have. We have a volunteer fire department. We have no police department. And my concern is the residents. Also, by not having um, um, business come in who's going to be paying taxes, eventually our taxes are going to have to go up to compensate for the loss of revenue. Also, if there's a homeless um, shelter next to the Glen, it's going to decrease our property values. And if in time some of the residents may have to go to uh, assisted living, um, it's going to impact the amount of um, sales of their home, which um, could be very hurtful for the residents. So therefore, I am opposed to um, this being approved by the board. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comment. <laughs> anyone, else, anyone else in the audience care to make a public comment? Nobody online? No one is unmuting okay. the house, so. All right, public comment is closed. And thank you all for your excellent comments and uh, <coughs> adhering to the time requests and everything else. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. I think uh, we'll turn to our professionals now. Do you have any other questions or comments? The, yeah. the member has a question. Yeah, I, okay. I, I have one question that was brought up the last time about safety. And I know it was talked today about the safety of where this is located. From my understanding with the New Jersey law, and I could be wrong, if these people are getting off the public transportation by Wawa right now, if this is a state highway, if there's not a path or a sidewalk, they are. To, what is stated is that the, the people have to cross the street to walk against traffic so they can see the traffic coming toward them. So that means that if these people get off the bus at Wawa, they would have to cross over 38 so they can walk against the traffic so they can see what the traffic is coming. They have to cross over at Foster Town so that they can come to the Beacon of Hope. Uh, and the people at, uh, um, coming from the east, from heading east, would have to get at Foster Town Road and cross over and then walk to the Beacon. Again, it's a state highway. Route 38 is a state highway. There's not a path. I don't see a path. And I talked about sidewalks back when I said from Wawa to the Beacon, there's not a path and there's not a sidewalk. What is the answer to that? Okay, do uh, any of our professionals have any more comments? Mrs. Newcomb? <laughs> Mr. Taylor? No, sir. Mr. Miller? I would like to point out during their presentation. Mark. I'd like to point out that during their whole presentation, it was, it seemed to me that we had assumed that the whole issue was parking and that they, were, they didn't never in, indicate it that there was going to be a pedestrian traffic to their, to their uh, either worship or the pantry. The whole presentation was uh, based upon uh, vehicle traffic to the site. I didn't hear anything about pedestrian traffic. From them or from us? From the, well, I mentioned it the last time I was here in February. I, I said, where's the sidewalk from, from Wawa to the Beacon? And nobody said anything. So then I looked up online, and then what it states in there, if it's a state highway, it has to be a path or a sidewalk. If not, they have to walk to the far left of the oncoming traffic. Great. You can put our 
traffic engineer back on to comment? Okay, that's what you want to do, yeah. I'm sorry, you want me to say something or not? Okay, yeah, so I just wanted to, um, it's, it's, um, so it's New Jersey Statute 39.4-34, I believe is what you're referencing to. And it talks about the fact that, yes, um, on a roadway you should, if there's no sidewalk available, walk on the left side of the road or the opposite direction. Um, however, it does say where applicable. And I think given the conditions on Route 38 as they exist today with the fact that there's an existing median barrier in the middle of the road, it's not applicable, applicable for um, the purpose of getting from the bus stop location at Wawa to our site, if there were a pedestrian that wanted to do that, to have them cross the road, go down, and, and then come back. So I think given that, it wouldn't be illegal for them to walk down the side of the road. Um, it's not encouraged under law, but I don't think given the conditions on Route 38 as it exists today, that it would be against the law. But I understand your comment. You say that again, the last part again, you don't think it would be what? I don't think it would be um, illegal for them to do that given the existing conditions on Route oh. 38 with a barrier in the middle of the road. Because you don't want people crossing the road um, at an uncontrolled location. You don't want them crossing where there are barriers. So given the current configuration, I think that would be permitted for them to walk on the right side of the road from the bus stop to the property. Can I just have one follow-up to that? W would it be safer for there to be sidewalks? For pedestrian movements, it's always safer to have a sidewalk. So understanding you don't have control from your property to the Wawa, why is the applicant requesting, and I don't think we ever really got any testimony, requesting a waiver of sidewalk along the frontage? I think there was some professional. I think we had testified to the fact that we were requesting the waiver because there is no existing sidewalk between our property today and the existing bus stop location. But correct me if I'm wrong, I think somebody did yes. testify to that. But ultimately, if that site came back in for approvals, they would be required and then there would be sidewalk, except on your site. So I, I have an issue with the lack of sidewalk on your site. Just from the board standpoint, <coughs> It's my opinion, you, you, you can't obligate them to make a connection in front of an adjacent property to do an off-site or off-track mm -hmm. improvement, knowing that, knowing that there are uh, folks who are anticipated to be using this from the bus stop. The less linear footage that anybody walks on a state highway, the safer they are. Yeah. So even if somebody is walking for 100 feet on this site, but on the adjacent site, they have to walk on the shoulder. At least we made those folks safer for that 100 feet for that connection. So I, I right. as you all know, I'm a strong proponent of sidewalks, and I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly in favor of a waiver. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I agree with, with, with Scott that we should provide sidewalk. However, because there's a bus stop to the east, we should provide it from the corner of our property on the eastern corner and then cover it to the uh, far western driveway entrance because going farther is where you're going to hit uh, the wetlands the stream and that's impractical to build but i think a partial design exception for having completed all the way to the western property line because that's where the wetlands are but i think it's reasonable to have it to the um, uh, uh, eastern corner, which is where it's next to Legacy, run it all along the frontage, and then end it uh, in the proximity of the second driveway, the, the driveway that exits. That way, someone walking along there can make their way into the pro property. And then in the future, when other properties come in for, for any change or redevelopment, you make them connect into that eastern corner and then continue on down. Okay. But that, that, that's a practical, reasonable condition. Okay. I have a question, gentlemen, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, well, we've made many applicants make off site improvements, such as jump handles, intersections. Yes, no? Um, the, the state does at times, and, and the county has. Um, I would defer to Mr. Kingsbury about the board's ability to impose an off-track or off-site. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I don't think the board would have jurisdiction to do that. Okay. Just to answer some questions that have been asked by other people, I'm not trying to testify, but I am going to testify. Uh, between Wawa and the location for the um, pastor's church, house of worship, not only are there no sidewalks there, there in some instances is not even a shoulder. Okay. Um, and the reason I know this, I used to bike ride through that whole area, and I, it was like I almost had a death wish when I used to try to leave Wawa and head west on Route 38. But uh, it's it's a, a difficult area, and uh, it's you know the, the points that have been raised have been well taken, and you know the applicant is proposing to put a sidewalk in front of their property, which they could do. We would like that, but they're not obligated to put a sidewalk on somebody else's property. I do have one more comment, and I, I remembered it, but I, I couldn't. The, the, uh, Kathy, the development on Creek Road, the new development <coughs> that was built by the same developer, the um, uh, Scarborough built the development. Mason's Woods. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mason's I do remember it. Correct me if I'm wrong. That the part of that approval, they were required or a deal was made to build a sidewalk from that development up to Creek Road. Well, we're going back probably 25 years ago since my son. There is a asphalt. Yep. Mm -hmm. Bike path. I don't know if it's only my bike path. Bike path. Bike path. Bike path. Um, for that. It does not go on their property because there's a 50 foot buffer between Creek Road and the development that backs up. So and that part of Creek Road is our property. So it was part of the development that that connection and again you I can't speak out of term because I don't have a resolution in front of me. I don't know what the conditions are. Yet from that corner uh, goes into Mason's Wood, meaning the first left. That piece there that goes out to uh, the corner of Mount Laurel Road and Creek uh, is pretty much asphalt. And it was, if I recall correctly, it's called a bike path, mm -hmm. not necessarily a sidewalk. Which I can't. You can I get into the fact is that a sidewalk. Is it a bike path? You take a look at those definitions that they can define the same, they can define differently. But um, you have to be careful in the sense is that something that happened 25 years ago and the requirements for this application may not necessarily apply to it. I think it's because it's a local roadway. It's because we own the road. Right. So I think that that's why. Okay, I got you. Yeah. I one guess it was an agreeable part of the condition. One of the things that I would ask the traffic engineer is what Ms. Pasco has stated was about the application to them. Is that in that application, was it shown or requested a variance or a waiver from DOT not to have a sidewalk? What was part of your application in regards to sidewalks to them? Sure. So the application that we made to DOT was for the change in use of the property from the commercial that it was private previously to the house of worship. And the change in use included not changing the existing driveways as they are today or as they were approved previously for the commercial use. Uh, under the DOT's access code, which are their guidelines, um, they have what's called a letter of no interest submission where you can submit a package demonstrating that the change in use does not create a significant increase in traffic, which is a defined thing under the DOT guidelines, meaning the new site does not generate more than 100 additional peak hour trips compared to what was previously approved or in this case grandfathered in because it was before the accident. <coughs> so we're able to demonstrate that this use does not create a significant increase in traffic. We're not modifying the existing driveways. Therefore, it meets the criteria for the DOT to grant a letter of no interest in lieu of having to go for a new driveway permit. So because of that, there's no obligation to submit site plans 
for the full application package, there's no obligation to provide sidewalk under that, under that approval from NJDOT. However, if the board does decide the sidewalk would be desirable along our frontage, that could be accomplished through a separate construction permit um, application and request to NJDOT, because again, it's still their jurisdiction um, along the frontage. So then if the board decided that this will uh, be approved and they requested the sidewalk to be there and the applicant was willing to do that, would it be fair to say that, again, the ultimate authority comes down to DOT saying yes or no? Yes, the DOT has complete jurisdiction over any improvements within their right of way. Right. Yes. Thank you. Sure. While you're at it, given your, your uh, history of dealing with DOT, yes. um, if a sidewalk was proposed to them for frontage on the site or as or limited uh, limited sidewalk as as was proposed um, are you are you able to say with, with any professional certainty uh, what DOT's reaction to that would be for this particular site as long as the proposed sidewalk meets the DOT roadway design manual criteria and the guidelines that they, they put forth uh, for what they want to see as far as the size and, and location and design of it, most likely they would approve it. Um, but it's always varies, but, you know, from location to location. But typically, if you propose a sidewalk along your frontage and it meets their guidelines, you know, they will issue a, a permit to construct that sidewalk. Sure. And if for some reason DOT had an issue with that, you would have the ability to actually relocate it to a sidewalk easement immediately behind the right of way to avoid a DOT permitting issue, correct? Correct. If the township wanted the sidewalk and DOT said it could not be within the existing right of way for whatever reason, um, there could be sidewalk put on private property with an easement granted for public access, assuming that the township did approve that. So I'd recommend it be sort of handled both ways. So if DOT says we're not in favor because there is no curbing in that location, I don't believe. So sometimes they don't like sidewalk to be on it within their right of way. Correct. That was, you know, that's one of those things we'd have to look at if we did a design right. for it. So they, they're not uh, often not in favor and will not approve a sidewalk within their right of way unless there is curbing. So if that issue happens, we'd like the ability for it to be either in the right of way if permitted by DOT or within a sidewalk easement on the private property. I don't think there's curbing at the new giant development going up that has a sidewalk so you should pass into Mount Laurel that had the point. There's a sidewalk there now. Mm -hmm. I'm not the planner of Mount Laurel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you all. Uh, Councilor, you asked for uh, closing arguments, if you will. Yeah, just just a few comments. I know it's, uh, it's getting late, and everybody's. Uh, this has been a long, uh, long road for everybody. Um, so, just just a couple of closing comments. Just com confirming that. Pastor Trappier, who you've heard from considerably or to a large extent, great extent, uh, during the course of this application, she is. Um, she would want me to convey that she's very much looking forward to bringing uh, the house of worship uh, to this site uh, here in Haynesport Township. She's a resident of Haynesport Township, and this is um, really a, a dream of hers uh, to uh, bring the house of worship here and um, to be able to serve God and the community from her own community. Um, that's uh, that's uh, special stuff, for lack of a better way to say it. Um, she did want me to convey that, um, uh, that there is no pedestrian component to uh, this use. Uh, while um, there may be um, an occasional pedestrian who um, comes to this site, we don't have a pedestrian component to our use, uh, to the house of worship. She testified early on that um, our congregation, um, generally speaking, has uh, vehicles. Um, and um, they have contracts with various 
um, the services uh, such as Uber uh, to uh, bring people to that site, to bring people to their existing site who don't have another way to get there. Um, the pedestrian component of the use as it exists in uh, Mount Holly is, um, is different. It will not function that way here. Those individuals who would w walk now to the Mount Holly site for uh, food pickup, for example, will be serviced as the pastor testified. Um, and I'm not testifying to, to uh, quote the chairman, I'm not testifying because I'm not permitted to do that, but this is what has been testified to by Pastor Trappier, and of course you could ask her to confirm this. She sits right to my left. Um, the um, pedestrian component uh, of the um, client base that comes to the Mount Holly facility will be serviced um, uh, on Thursday evenings um, by vehicle, we will take the food uh, to those individuals who would have walked to the Mount Holly facility. We will be um, transporting it in vehicles on Thursday evenings to them um, because they will no longer be able to walk to us. Um, but again, um, we are a house of worship. As I said, that, that's been our, um, this is our fundamental use, and um, we've made that clear and continue to make that clear. Um, and the pastor, as I said, is very um, excited about the prospect of being able to uh, bring the church and the associated services to her own community, as we said. Uh, the county has granted us, um, given us a $400,000 grant, and um, um, I'm going to take the liberty of telling you that um, Pastor Trappier has invested, and she can confirm this, she has, um, on behalf of Beacon of Hope, already invested $100,000 in this uh, process, in this site, um, in getting approvals. Um, uh, for this site. So um, I hope I didn't overstep by uh, saying that, but I think it's important that you know that. Um, but that's how committed she is to, uh, to her own community, to Haynesport Township, to this site. And uh, we thank you for your kind uh, attention uh, during our presentation um, over the number of hours that it uh, went on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, th this is the last time I'm going to ask if the board members or professionals have any questions of the applicant. Nope. If not, we're, it's up to, to the board now. It's our turn. Uh, and I'll ask the board collectively what's your pleasure with regard. Oh, wait. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Kingsbury. This is uh, Initial vote is whether or not to grant the use of variance for the House of Work yeah. and the Food Pantry. The site plan is second issue. Okay, that's what I was going to, that's why I said Everything wait. Everything on the use variance, and you need five yes out of seven for the pantry. Okay, so we're, uh, we're talking about... Uh, the the Haynesport Township Ordinance that does not allow a house of worship in a highway commercial property. Right. We have to take action on that first. Right. And if it passes, we then move on to the site plan variances. And if it doesn't pass, then we don't go any further. Is that right? If it doesn't pass, then there's no point in voting on the site plan. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Okay. Chair. Yes, ma'am. It's actually for Mr. Kingsbury. Um, when when um, they were referencing the, the can, you, can you use the microphone? I thought I was. Um, when they were referencing the the Sika versus Wall Township, was that case having to do with a house of worship with the Sika? And if it was, was it 
dealing with a house of worship that wanted to be on a major I highway. The speaker was the house of worship speaker, so I'm aware of that. It wasn't. It, it, it was not. It, 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 it was with a head trauma facility. A head it, trauma facility? Head trauma. What, what the SIGID case is about, it, it def helped define the term inherently beneficial use. So there are a number of inherently beneficial uses in New Jersey. Houses of worship are inherently beneficial. Yeah, okay. Hospitals, head trauma facilities, uh, community uh, shelters. Those are all inherently, mm -hmm. so, but this was the first case that helped define what the tests are. Mm -hmm. And so those steps that I described is what has to be uh, uh, followed and applied mm -hmm. for any inherently beneficial use. Okay. So that that's that's the, that that's why I had to use that as a planner mm -hmm. because to use anything else would have been inappropriate and I wouldn't have followed the law. Right. Okay. I do have another question. <laughs> so um, how we don't permit it in the township to have a house of worship on a, on a major highway. So I've just been trying to go through in my head, you know, going down 38, and then I'm, go I'm thinking 73, I'm thinking 70, I'm thinking a lot of the, the major highways that we have around here. Are there any churches around here that are on major highways? Is, or is this a unique thing to Haynesport, or is this like a, an area or a New Jersey thing? I can ask that from a planning standpoint. Okay. Um, it depends. That does not help me. See, that was my legal. That was my legal opinion. Obviously, it is a completely mixed bag. A lot of municipalities will allow places of worship in almost any zone in their community. Mm -hmm. There are some towns that try to keep a commercial core where there is synergy between retail uses or restaurant uses, and and they provide certain zones where places of worship are permitted or conditionally permitted uses. So there really is no kind of planning standard um, any way of they should be or should not be on state highways. As Mark was talking about with the CICA test, normally we talk about the positive criteria in an application, is the site suitable, is, is the, does it promote one of the purposes of the municipal land use? <coughs> And then we talk about the negative criteria. So what Mark was saying is the case law under SICA basically takes the need for addressing the positive criteria and the purposes of, of zoning away from the board. And it, you really have to focus, as Mark said, on what are the negative components of the application and then do those negative aspects, does the public benefit outweigh the negative components. Don't forget the reasonable conditions. Along with reasonable conditions. That's, that's the balancing test. And by the way, there are a lot of churches in so, Route 130. Yes. And, and right some. 70, right okay. 70 and 73. Yeah. Yep. I was just trying to go. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Mr. Kohlfarber? Yes. Will we be able to provide a comment before we vote? Um, yes, no. Okay. Go for it. Well, okay. No, do you, did you have a comment? Well, at this point, you've been asking if we had any questions of the professionals, but I, okay. I'll wait until, until my vote to okay. provide comment. Yeah, wait, when, when we finish and we go to a proposal to consider variance, then I'll ask if there are any questions on the motion, but if you have a question that's not pertaining to that? No question, no. Okay. Or a comment? Well, I'd like to provide comment before I provide my vote. Okay, then how about let's do it now. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> and forgive me because it's a little lengthy. So first I want to congratulate Pastor Trappier for her honor as being named um, a woman of the year. I think it's quite a prestigious thing and I congratulate you and all your efforts. It's very clear that you provide an amazing service um, to many, many people in the community. 
Um, but first, I just want to back up for when you did submit your application to Burlington County for the Community Development Block Grant. Um, and that was back in 2021. And at that point, you had sent an email you had requested for me to write a support letter for that grant opportunity. And in that email from you, um, you had stated that you originally started out to just be a food pantry and a clothes closet, but it has evolved to include the following services. A life skills training center, classes for parenting, financial freedom, 21st century employment, no more abuse, domestic violence, children's summer feeding service, Salvation Army Service Center, Salvation Army Cattle Coordinator Services for South Jersey, Emergency Code Blue Shelter, Case Management Services for Rent Utility Security Deposit First Month Rent, Emergency Transportation, Uber Lyft, Children Back to School Supplies, Produce Distribution Site for Farmers Against Hunger, Work in Conjunction with the Burlington County Health Department for COVID-19 Testing, Influenza and J&J &J Vaccinations, Home Food Delivery for Disabled Seniors and Shut-ins, Emergency Meal Placement, emergency food distribution, clothes closet, winter clothing distribution, Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner basket distribution, Christmas toys distribution. I'm currently in negotiations to purchase and renovate the site. Um, since the COVID-19 pandemic arrived, we have seen a 200% increase in requested services. And even though we have been able to continue providing the much needed assistance, we have outgrown our present location. Um, and then you listed all the various different organizations that you work with. Um, and that you also serve as a member of you know, various different organizations as well. And you cited a lot of well-deserved honors and awards, um, stating that you've man you have a mandate to from God to feed the hungry, cl hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, and visit the sick and the shut-in. Um, so that was the basis of your application to the county for the grant funding. And, and then moving forward, also in your in the article from USA Today, um, it does say a nonprofit organization that provides hundreds of thousands of pounds of food to people in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and that you give out 600,000 to 900,000 pounds of food every year. And going through the article, um, it's a great article. And then also seeing, you know, there was a picture of the front of your current location, Beacon of Hope, changing lives one heart at a time. Um, to receive food, you must wear a mask, food and clothing distribution every Friday from nine to one. Um, and then also just different, you know, cited quotes as well. And then during the testimony for the last several months, um, we, you talked about the various um, programs and offers, offerings that you provide, including a food drive, uh, life skills classes, Code Blue, things of that nature. Code Blue could be up to four months, uh, 12 hours at a time. You know, I do get the Code Blue notifications as the administrator uh, for Hainsport Township. I see how often those Code Blue designations do get put out, and I understand it's really in essence to, to open up funding resources for all the recipients. And it, it could be up to 20 times you know, within a month. So if we just average that out, that could be up to 28 hours a week. Um, your life skills classes based on your testimony, um, two days a week from, from nine to one, that's, that's about eight or nine hours per week. The food drive, um, you know, if you extend that, that's currently nine to one on, I believe it was Mondays and Fridays, or was it just Fridays for, Okay. And then also the clothing drive, maybe that was what was on Mondays. So there's all these different services and they're, they're multiple hours. And then you cited that the, the church services um, would be Sunday from 11 to 2 and then Bible study for one and a half hours. And I just Mrs. Edwards opened up that we are a house of worship, that it is a primary use and everything else is ancillary. But when I do all the calculations and I look at all of the documents and the emails from you, it seems that all the other services are primary in the house of worship. And I know it doesn't matter at the end of the day, it's an inherently beneficial use, but in all of the articles, it never once said that there were church services for being provided. On the front of the door at the center in Mount Holly, it doesn't say church services. And I get that if that's something that you wanna make a primary use now, that I understand that, but based on everything that I've seen and I've read in the testimony, all the other uses seem to be primary, especially the hours that are they're going to be presented and offered during the week. Now, with that being said, I ran a senior center in Pemberton Township for 15 years. I am from Pemberton Township. I work with Madeline Mears. 
I work with the homeless shelter there. Um, I understand what you do because I did it for 15 years and I understand the need and how you are definitely um, working through the Lord in this and it's unbelievably commendable for it. But for 15 years I ran a lot of the programs that you, you run. At our location in Browns Mills at 300 Brook Street, there were 44 parking spaces. We ran a South Jersey, uh, we, we collaborated with the South Jersey uh, Food Bank. I also collaborated with the Farmers Against Hunger. Uh, we oversaw a lot of the same programs, clothing distribution. We offered a congregate meal site. We offered transportation programs and ser social service programs as well, and recreation programs during and after hours at the senior center. We had to move our, our South Jersey uh, food program from the senior center, and this is a local road. It's a, it's a local road which, which um, distributes traffic onto a local roadway, uh, Brook Street. Um, we had to move it to another location because we had circular drive issues, um, we had accidents, uh, we had traffic issues, we had parked cars that were unable to maneuver in and out of spots, we had pedestrian issues, very dangerous getting to the vehicles or to the food distribution location. Um, also the Farmers Against Hunger, we had to move to another location, um, actually close to um, Buttonwood Hospital across the street in Imagination Kingdom because it had such a much, it was empty and it was a huge parking lot and it really allowed for circulation, better circulation and safety. Um, you know, I'm also concerned that I made a request um, to your traffic engineer for the actual application to DOT um, and, and that was not provided and the life skills classes, not once was it ever stated that those were remote. Now all of a sudden that was stated tonight. Um, I've worked with um, vulnerable populations. Um, I know that Burlington County off currently offers a lot of the same programs and they do that physically at their location on Wood Lane Road. Um, it's because it's very difficult to service that population online. Um, it's usually generally the, the, the format is in person. Um, so it's just concerning that the goalpost seems to be moving. Um, everything has been changing and that makes me uncomfortable tonight. And also living, living your experience for 15 years, I, I, I feel like I do understand the site suitability concerns and, and the safety issues um, because we had to, to make those adjustments ourselves and move those particular services to another, another location. So I just want to say as a board member, those are my biggest concerns are the site suitability and, and living your experience um, and understanding how things do change. Um, but safety obviously is, is a concern for me as a board member at this point in time. Thank you. Okay, so board, what's your pleasure? We need to take some action on the first uh, variance request, which we have been talking about the last couple of minutes. So Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll make a motion to grant the D variance that has been sought by the applicant, um, weighing the necessary criteria, positive and negative, as um, the applicant's expert has discussed and, and our, our planner has discussed, um, there's an inherent public interest in the house of worship and as well in the ancillary social services proposed to be provided. Balanced against, uh, balancing that against detrimental impact negative criteria. Uh, there are uh, the issue of uh, foregone real estate taxes, I suppose. There's the issue of the impact on the master plan. And this is intended to be uh, a commercial area and this would, this would be divergence from, from that. And of course there is the uh, traffic slash parking issues which have been talked about uh, to great length. But uh, my motion uh, states that balancing the positive criteria against the negative criteria, uh, the, the positive criteria uh, weighs more heavily 
Uh, the applicant has proposed reasonable conditions. To the applicant has proposed reasonable conditions. that have ameliorated whatever negative criteria may have been presented and discussed. So that's my motion. Vote on it. I'll second the motion. Any questions on the motion? This motion is just for Pardon? the variance. This my motion is just for the D variance. Just, just for, for the, the D variance. Okay. okay. Okay, um, <clears throat> roll call, please. Hearing no questions. Mr. Novarita? Uh, no. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Murphy? No. Mrs. Tyndale? Yes. Yes. Ms. Costco? No. Mr. Crowfleifer? No. And Mr. McKay? Yes. Four no's. It doesn't pass, so the site plan is your loop. Right. The what? The site plan is moved because the use of our rail got sufficient work. Okay. <sighs> so we're finished. Yeah. <clears throat> Next matter on the agenda, Mr. Chair. Yeah. The um, the the, the uh, request by the applicant for a variance has been declined by the board. And we have some other business to attend to here, so if you just exit quietly, we would appreciate it, because we want to get home early, too. She said don't start. It's a it's a it's a great club, but not here, not in this location. <laughs> okay, we I'm sorry. We have the um Oh, that's right. Yeah, they're, they're going to come back. I thought they left. Oh, that was a very interesting. It was. People voted. I like, you know, people voted. I didn't know that. I like See, that's what I do. Yeah. On 130, I've known them on 73. Yeah. You know, so that part didn't bother me. Some of the other parts bother me. But not that yeah. I mean, I I respect everything she's yeah. trying to do, but it's, that's, that's a bad location for us. See, I, for the next part, oh. the cycling, I would have had more volume. Yeah, so I, I, had, I, I hope I don't like it at 38. That's yeah. my problem. I, I, everything oh, she's doing. Oh, you didn't listen yeah, to uh, the tapes? But I just, I, really, I mean, I understand there's churches on one third. I do. Well, we'll see where we go yeah, from here. I guess there's really no way to listen uh, to the tapes remotely. You can't, like, uh, it's recorded. Yeah, but you can yeah. come in with the headphones on and listen. Gus? Whether there's. Jill. It's been years since I asked to come up with this meeting. Are you ready? Ask Gus to come up here with you first. I want to ask that question. I don't know whether uh, you could. Uh, 
whether it's online, so you could go in and no. log in. We're waiting for. Um, yeah. All right. So you know. Leave this here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I hear you. That was the trigger. Scott, you leave one. Oh, Gibson tax. No. Lewis, you're in the. You're in the. I don't feel bad. I don't. I don't feel that that will be bad. We adjourned or what? Really fun to arrive. It gets all uh, the air melting. Yes. Yes. Okay, folks. We have a couple of other like, items no, of business to go through. Yep. Um, host connection. We have the minutes from the December 7th, 2022 meeting, and also the minutes of the reorganization meeting on January 4th, 2023. And we can do them in one motion. Separately. Two separate motions. That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I make a motion that we accept the minutes of the uh, December 7th meeting and file them. Seven. Any questions on the motion? No. Roll call, please. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Gilmore? Yes. Mr. McKay? Yes. Mr. Dracochi? Yes. Mrs. Tindell? Yes. Mrs. Buckingham? Yes. Ms. Costco? Yes. Mr. Kroll Pfeiffer? Yes. Uh, the minutes for the January 4th, 2023 reorganization meeting? I make a motion that we accept and file the minutes of the reorganization meeting on January 4th, I second. 2023. I second. Who seconded? I did. Not Jim. Oh, okay. Great. Any questions on the motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Baggio? Yes. Mr. McKay? Oh, I'm slipping the switch, yes. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Gilmore? Yes. Mr. Chicochi? Yes. Mrs. Tyndale? Yes. Ms. Costco? Yes. Mr. Bradley? Yes. And Mr. Paul Piper? Yes. Uh, we have no resolution, so we'll go to tw the 12 items of correspondence that we have in a motion and a second to accept the correspondence and file it. I make a motion that we accept the correspondence and file it. Second. Okay, any questions on the motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mrs. Baggio? Yes. Mrs. Tyndale? Yes. Mr. McKay? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Gilmore? Yes. Mr. Tricochi? Yes. Ms. Costco? Yes. Mr. Bradley? Yes. And Mr. Pearl Piper? Yes. Professional comments. I found that was a very interesting <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I need a bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> I need a scotch. <laughs> I need a beer. I need a scotch. Bring it with you. And I want a beer. One bourbon, one scotch, one beer. Got you. Got you. Thanks. Wait. Mrs. Know. Newcomb, any under professional comments? Uh, I've got that earmark. Huh? So I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Okay. Uh, any comments from the board? Something might order for something. Yeah. I wish I would have had. I, I didn't know that I could, go to could be there or Miss get up to speed on the previous meeting. Yeah. I, well, I didn't know that I had. To but, do that. but we've. Th this is like the first that we had that went to three meetings. I know we had one since I've been on the board in 17 years that we had two meetings. Right. And I had to listen to the tape. Yeah, I had to to but the, you can all, if you listen to the tape, uh, Paul Tyra fills out a form and certifies that you can hear the case and vote on it so okay. yeah, I didn't know that. yes sir and i'm not against the use i'm against the location me too yeah. me too i agree i would i and you know the shame of it is i can remember when this application first came to light you know we had and i hope that we're still doing it that we have the economic development committee that why we're still doing that Yes. And had that application come, we never, we never told an applicant they were going to pass or fail. 
But, you know, this that thing had a flavor. And, you know, I personally just think it's, it's I mean, if it was a pizza parlor or something, you know, it would work. I mean, yeah, it, it would work. You on the record? Well, no, I, I know I'm on the record. But I would encourage the municipality to find a location that we could put this. That's a better student, you know. Because mm -hmm. the location just was a tough one. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're now at uh, public comments. Does anybody in the public have a comment? <laughs> there are three members online still. If anybody has a comment online. Uh, they didn't uh, wake up before. Public <laughs> one. <laughs> Hearing no comments for the public, especially from online people i will close public comment and seek adjournment all in favor all right. all right i would wish everybody a happy holiday Nega. good job Mr. yes Chairman. thank you happy easter happy hanukkah no 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 sorry sorry passover, sorry. passover. 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 starts tonight what's the